in the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa. We ask these ancestors to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa and marched down the Nile, laying the foundations for human civilization and culture, we ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of these African ancestors who built their pyramids and their temples to their God concepts, to their principles, and to their moral values, who left us a legacy of architectural and monumental building unparalleled in the history of the world, we ask these ancestors who built the pyramids, who built the temples, to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these African ancestors who took this African culture and extended it throughout Africa, building the stone cities of Zimbabwe, building the empires of the Sudan, Ghana, Mali, and Sangai, building the Swahili city-states along the east coast of Africa, and in Christian Africa, asking King Lalibela and giving him the courage to build the 12 churches of Lalibela from the ground down, monuments to the world. We ask these Africans who spread this culture to the Dogo and to the Akan and to the Yoruba and to the Bankongo and to the Zulu. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the Africans who opened up Africa, opened up the Nile Valley to other cultures and other peoples and they came in and nurtured themselves on the African greatness. First coming in early with the ancient Hebrews and they synthesized this culture and produced Judaism. Later coming in with the Christians and they synthesized this culture and produced Christianity. Coming in were also the Greeks who took the African culture, synthesized it and produced Greek civilization. And then later the Prophet Muhammad and with the Arabs coming into the Nile Valley, they synthesized the culture and produced Islam. We ask these African ancestors who as part of their legacy laid the foundations for Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Greek civilization to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. We ask those African ancestors pulled out of Africa, taken to the hells of North America, South America, the Caribbean, maintaining the spirit of African humanity in their hearts and in their minds, and who left us this enormous legacy of struggle. We ask those Africans who resisted enslavement in the villages of Africa, who resisted enslavement in the shores of Africa, who resisted enslavement in those forts and dungeons, who resisted enslavement in the holes of those ships, who resisted enslavement when they arrived on these shores in the New World. We ask these Africans who ran into the highlands of Northeast Brazil and established for 100 years the first free republic in the Americas, the Republic of Palmares, and their last great leader, Zumbi, whose spirit and sacrifice we ask these Africans who replicated the Brazilian experience and went into the highlands of Jamaica and became the maroon free communities. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of the Guyanas and Suriname and created free republic of the Suramaka and the Ajuka. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of Georgia and the swamps of Florida and moved with the Seminole Indians and resisted oppression. We ask these Africans who left us a legacy of struggle and resistance, the likes of which no one in the world has to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who created and laid for us a foundation of struggle and resistance that was passed on generation after generation, that was passed on to Harriet Tubman who fought away out of enslavement and became a symbol of freedom for all of us. Similarly, Frederick Douglass and hundreds of thousands of others fought their way out of enslavement. We ask those Africans who went with Bookman Dessaline to create the greatest revolutionary experience in the history of the world, the Haitian Revolution, leaving us a legacy, the likes of which no one else has had. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. It's 10 minutes after 6 o'clock. It's Sunday, June 22. You're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African, reuniting the African family for development. That is a vision, the vision of the program, reuniting the African family for development. And our mission, bearing witness, demanding change, developing an African-centered agenda for change. We're blazing new paths towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny. Good morning to you. 
Thank you for joining us on the 107s. 107.1 all the way to 107.9. Thank you for joining us on the internet at irefm.net. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. If you're joining us on your Android, your Blackberry, your iPhone apps, good morning, welcome. You're inside of the sacred space, the Africa Forum. This is where all Pan-African issues are welcomed, discussed, interrogated, and solutions determined the way forward. Reuniting the African family for development. As we continue to blaze new paths towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny. Not prepared as a sergeant for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah warns us and reminds us and encourages us. Should not be prepared to wait on the evolution of history because this is an urgency. This is war. Our very livelihood, our very lives depend on our action. So we're not prepared to wait on the evolution of history. But we are standing firm in the belief that we must give history a revolutionary push. And that is by our action. What we do, not what we say. We are not who we say we are. We are what we do. Very pleasant morning to you. Good morning and welcome to the space. As we invite the spirit of the ancestors to this space at this time in this place right now. And especially now, especially now, as the spirits seem to be at war with each other <laughs> through those who continue to live. And as Maroons gather in Portland, we invite into this space the spirit of Chief Tai Chi, Chief Taki. We invite into this space the spirit of Chief Taki. We invite into this space at this time and this place right now. Ancestor, please come, Chief Taki. We invite into this space, into this place right now at this time, the spirit of Ancestor Baba Paul Bogle right now in the space at this time, in this place. Understanding that the revolution is just beginning, that we must continue to realize the dream of emancipation, that we must continue to realize the dream of full free, full freedom, full liberation. We invite into this space at this time, in this place right now, the spirit of the ancestor, Chief Tati, Paul Bogle, Queen Nanny. Ancestor, come. We call your name. And especially right now, especially right now, when the government of Jamaica appears as if they would want to, they would want to scrap the celebrations of emancipation, appear as if they would want to stop us from recalling and remembering who we are and who we were and what we are supposed to do, what is still left, what is unfinished. Especially because the Ministry of Culture would want to silence us. Especially because the Ministry of Culture would not have us talk our truth. We speak truth to power without fear. Do your very best. Those who speak truth have no friends. And those who are afraid to speak the truth will remain enslaved. We must not be afraid to speak truth to power. We must also call the names of the ancestors. Those who fought in the Emancipation Wars of 1831-32. Because now, now, the state would have us forget them. And so before we do anything else, we must call the names. We must call their names. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. This is war, and we don't come to laugh. We come because we are part of the army. So we must call their names. My name is Kabu Ma'at Keru. My broadcast assistant this morning is Joy Morgan. Our telephone operator on the desk is Simone Brown Keys. Good morning. Welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Let us call their names. We pay 
pay tribute and honor our ancestors, those who were tried and sentenced for their role in the 1831-1832 Emancipation War in Jamaica, the parish of Westmoreland. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free, say I'm loud, say I'm clear. Garrick from Belfast in St. James, sentenced to 259 lashes. David Gibson from Clifton, sentenced to death. John Gilling, owned by Mrs. Parncher, sentenced to 36 lashes. Ishmael, alias Billy Grant from Prospect, 100 lashes. James Green, Clifton, sentenced to death. Frederick Gray from Rose Hill, sentenced to 100 lashes. Sam Hilton, from Lambs River, sentenced to 100 lashes. Philip Irving from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. William McIntosh from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 250 lashes. Duncan McKenzie from Flower Hill, sentenced to be transported. William McKinley, owned by S. Whittingham, sentenced to death. Richard McLeod from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. James Miller, owned by Dr. Fuller, sentenced to 160 lashes. John Morris from Clifton, acquitted. Coffey, alias Richard Morrison, from Rock Pleasant, sentenced to be transported. Richard Shelton from Ducket Spring and Lambs River, sentenced to 200 lashes. Premier, alias Richard Skelton, from Co Park, sentenced to be transported. John M. L. Stevens from Sevenage, sentenced to 200 lashes. George Tharp, owned by enslaver George Tharp, sentenced to 150 lashes. Titus, alias George Waite from Richmond, sentenced to death. George Watson from Horton Grove, sentenced to be transported. Robert Whitehorn from Clantharf, sentenced to death. Edward Whittingham from Call Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Eliza Whittingham from Call Park, sentenced to death. Jane Whittingham from Call Park, sentenced to be hanged. S. Whittingham from Call Park, sentenced to be transported. Robert Wigan from Lambs River, sentenced to be transported. Archie Wilson, owned by enslaver Archibald Wilson, sentenced to 150 lashes. John Wiley from Barnside, sentenced to be transported. Robert Morris, owned by Mary Spence, Stewie, sentenced to death. George Murray from Clifton, sentenced to death. Edward Partner, owned by Isabella Partner, sentenced to death. Philip, owned by William Shellett, sentenced to six months imprisonment. Southern trees. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Henry Cooper from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Henry Cowan from Argyle Pen, sentenced to death. Robert Davis from Sweet River, sentenced to be transported. Thomas Davis from Enfield, sentenced to be transported. Matty, alias Richard Drackett, owned by Mary Torrent, acquitted. John L. Lorry, owned by a white sailor, sentenced 14 days imprisonment. Hugh Ferguson from Clifton, sentenced to death. William Ferguson from Clifton, acquitted. Jack, alias John Fleming, owned by Daniel McGibbon, sentenced to 50 lashes. William Evans, alias Alexander Bentloss, from Welsh Pool Plantation, sentenced to death. William Brooks, Edward Barrett, from Ducket Spring and Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to death. John Bull, owned by Edward J. Young sentenced to death. John Campbell from Flaw Hill, sentenced to 120 lashes. William Chambers, owned by Mary Gray, sentenced to death. David Clark, owned by a Mr. Young, sentenced to 120 lashes. Samuel Jarrett from Crow Park, sentenced to death. Amelia Johnson, acquitted. Nelson Carr from Belfast St. James, sentenced to 150 lashes. Edward Lambden from Barneyside, sentenced to death. Robert Lambert, owned by William Gillette, Esquire, sentenced to 39 lashes. John Linton from Heritage, sentenced to death. 
Joe Little from Welchpool, sentenced to be hanged but mercifully escaped. James Reed from Hermitage, sentenced to death. Thomas Reed from Lambs River, sentenced to 150 lashes. James Ricketts, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. Thomas Rook, McHale's prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. Samuel Sampson, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 14 days imprisonment. William Martin from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. A.C. McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. George McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. John McCallum from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 60 lashes. Robert McGee from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Alexander Magrotha, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 200 lashes. James McIntosh, owned by Amelia McIntosh, sentenced to 250 lashes. Richard, alias Richard McIntosh, from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 100 lashes. Robert Allen, owned by enslaver Isabella Partner, sentenced to four dozen lashes. Jack Anderson, from the Retrieve Plantation, sentenced to death. John Appleton, from the Ducket Spring and Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to 100 lashes. David Atkinson, from Darleston, sentenced to death. William Atkinson, Darleston, sentenced to death. Fred, alias William Ball, owned by enslaver Mary Malin, sentenced to death. Daniel Barijam, from Tillons, sentenced to death. Billy, alias William Binham, from Golden Spring, sentenced to death. Blood on the leaves And blood at the roots We remember and honor those who walked and worked before us and thus paved the path down which we now walk. Hanging From the poplar trees Remembering and honoring those who fought in the Emancipation Wars. We're going to be playing this every single week at different times throughout the program. This and others like this throughout the program because the, it seems to me. And we've been asking the questions. They say we haven't been asking the questions. When we can get answers, we get them. When we can't, we say what we didn't get. Uh, that there is a plan afoot to wipe from our memories emancipation, the struggle for freedom from enslavement, those who fought and died in that war against enslavement and oppression. Because this current government, it seems to me, has no plans, no serious plans for emancipation this year. And this is not the only thing that's happening. We'll talk about this as we go on. We want to also look at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. We want to look at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and the makeup of the, the top guns of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. It seems to me as if there's something very fishy happening there. And let them do their very best. We are going to talk about it. We have to something happening at the National Heritage Trust in terms of those who would lead and those who would guide and where they are leading and where, where they are misguiding the country to. We must talk about that. We must talk about that in the context of not just Pinnacle, but in the context of emancipation and the celebration of freedom from enslavement. We must talk about that. So we'll do that throughout the morning and we'll do that in the coming weeks and uh, while we're in this space, we'll continue to talk about that. Blazing new paths towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny because we can't stop this. We can't stop this. We can give this a revolutionary push but Africa has a rendezvous with destiny and we are on that path to destiny towards that rendezvous, we must determine exactly what that will be and how that's going to be. So we put the Jamaica National Heritage Trust on notice that we see you 
and we are watching you and we will not allow we will not allow it some freedoms we have fought hard for and won in our quest to realize full freedom and full uh, liberation in our quest to ensure that that which our ancestors fought for here in this part of the world which is full freedom that that dream is fulfilled and you are entrusted with and have become the keeper of some of what we are able the, our abilities to celebrate and to realize this vision for freedom that's the Jamaica National Heritage Trust that is a ministry of culture you must recognize your role your responsibility the job that you have to do the majority of the Jamaican people here are the masses are African Jamaicans nationality Jamaican race African the majority of the Jamaican people the masses who you control that is government and the state are um, successive who you control through miseducation and poverty and political tribalism the majority of us are African black skin people black people and you would have those who would keep our heritage and there's nothing wrong because we do have a motto that doesn't mean anything really but uh, we, we, we say it uh, you know out of many one out of one many is really what it should be but let there be a proper representation at the top so that you have a voice or two representing the masses of the Jamaican people we do not like what we are seeing we do not like what we're seeing at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust we do not like what we're seeing at the Ministry of Culture in terms of the ministry's response to emancipation and cultural anything African cultural uh, here in Jamaica and we are going to talk about it and you can request this tape the Ministry of Culture requested the last um, program that we did talking about similar situations uh, the Minister of Culture has been very upset about it uh, she did call while I was on air uh, we were in the middle of, of an interview at the time and, uh, and, and we understand that she was very angry about some of what I was saying. Now, we are not going to keep anybody secret. If you call, we are going to talk about it. If you request a copy of the program, we are going to talk about it. And, and, and your response to us, we are also going to talk about it. Because we have one of our problems is that when we are under pressure as Pan-Africanists, as activists, as advocates, we keep that to ourselves and we bear that burden by ourselves. Well, we have learned over time that this is not the way to do it. We must take this to the public sphere, talk about it in the public. And, you know, after uh, two weeks ago uh, program, I found myself thinking about fear. Yes, because we're in a tribal society. We're in a violent society. And I found myself thinking about fear. And it led me to a quote. The person who said it is slipping me now. That fear is not, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is a recognition that there is something more important, something greater than fear. And that is what has kept me. And that is what is motivating me. That understanding. That is not that we are not fearful that something might be done to our person. It is that we understand that there is something greater than fear. And we must face that head on.
So we want to know what the government's plans are for the emancipation celebrations this year. We want to know what the government's plans are for the celebrations of 100 years of Garveyism. We want to know what's happening at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. We want to know what kind of representation African people have through the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. And we are asking those questions without fear. All right, so we've got an interesting program lined up for you this morning. We're going to be talking about this for a while, you know. Uh, we're not going to leave it. But we've got an interesting program lined up for you as we continue to blaze new paths towards, towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny. All right, what an interesting day yesterday. What an interesting day. What an interesting day it was yesterday. Uh, for those who were watching the uh, football, the World Cup, that was quite something, wasn't it? And I really do feel it for those persons who hopped off the um, the African uh, or Africa's bandwagon <laughs> for a moment there. Uh, and especially for those who made it public that you were hopping off um, Africa's wagon. <laughs> All right, so gone on. Play to a draw, was it? Yes, was it a draw for Ghana? Yeah. And uh, Nigeria, Nigeria winning. We're going to be making some links this morning. That Nigeria, that Nigeria, Ghana, Germany um, was a draw, and it was. You know how interesting this is. Because many are saying that it was a thrilling draw for Ghana and Germany. And it is true that it really was something else. Really like the Ghanaian team. Very steady. Uh, very focused. And regardless of what some persons are saying, we think they're playing good football. Right? Uh, we're no experts, but we've been watching football almost all our lives. <laughs> so, we think Ghana is playing damn good football. Alright, so we're loving Ghana. And we liked what we saw with Nigeria last yesterday. Good. So it's a pity that we had that 2-2 two -two draw with Germany, but let us see, let us see. Alright, so this morning, uh, Kenako, uh, Roger Haspel will be joining me live on the phone lines for Kenako to talk about what he saw yesterday and to look ahead. Also this morning, interesting developments uh, a few years ago. And, you know, we've been saying 2007 and then only to recognize um, after going back through the files that this is this uh, <clears throat> campaign to free the beach. Uh, here at IRFM started in 2005 and not 2007 as we have been saying but in any case it doesn't matter what we have now is that a response uh, from government and we've been hearing bits and pieces of this uh, in the news because this is not the first uh, Minister Wickham McNeil uh, spoke in Parliament d during the budget presentation and talked about the uh, plans to uh, institute beach parks which we said at the time good plans good plans but he talked about making one beach per parish a public beach and having this park and we're questioning that we're saying that that doesn't go far enough so we've been having responses Nepa uh, responded a few months ago and they themselves had said that they would be going on a consultative uh, uh, consultation tour across the island to ensure that they're talking to Jamaicans about issues to do with the beach. Now, I'm not quite sure if they did that. I didn't see anybody from Nepal in my you know, neck of the woods. Don't know if you did. But uh, lately, we've had the State Minister and the Ministry of Water, Land and the Environment and Climate Change Ian Hales announcing that government will be developing a comprehensive beach access and management policy that will enshrine access to beaches for Jamaicans into law. This has been one of our concerns 
as part of the campaign to free the beach uh, here in Jamaica since, you know, we started doing that. Uh, we, you know, when we started this, we were talking about access to beach, access to beach, you know, the ability to go to a public beach and so on and how they were selling off a pu the public beaches. And then with conversations with NEPA and with um, the work done by uh, Leslie Miles, a uh, journalist uh, who uh, formerly of Area FM was working with Running African from time to time, that he did a series uh, of, of um, features here in, on Running African a few months ago looking at the, 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 the behind the scenes, looking at the behind the story um, uh, issues that were driving this uh, what seemed to be lockout of the beaches uh, by government to Jamaicans. And one of the things he found is that the, the Beach Control Act, you know, was a problem in all of this. We also spoke with um, the now, he's now the... We pay tribute. He's now the, uh, the Tourism Board Chairman, I think. Yeah, we also spoke with... Uh, somebody who knows a lot about this many years ago uh, in the studio he came in and he said to us listen um, there is more to this than meets the eye it's not as simple as it sounds there are issues that have to be dealt with and some of these are related to the Beach Control Act so he pointed us to the Beach Control Act many 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 moons ago and after that, we started doing this, the, the, the research on the Beach Control Act. Our, our talk with NEPA uh, confirmed that, that the, the, the reason why there is, seems to be an exclusion from the beaches is that there is something written in law that does not necessarily provide immediate access to the sandy area. And there are talk, there are words like foreshore and you know watermark and and all of that. Remember that we were saying that that's so confusing. Where do you enter? Then do you enter from the sea or do you enter from where? From the sky and drop into the sea? How do you get access? So these are some of the issues that we've been looking at over time. And it seems to me from what the minister is saying, what we heard from NEPA and what the minister is now saying, that government will be developing a comprehensive beach access and management policy. And that the main goals of a policy are to provide physical access to the beach for sure and the sea. Uh, this is where I think we have a crux of the matter. So Ian Hale, State Minister and the Ministry of Water, Land and the Environment and Climate Change will be joining me on the phone lines to look at that uh, in more details this morning. Uh, we want to invite him to come into the studio later on and to take your questions. Uh, we don't want for this just to be announcements in parliaments because cause we've been having that and, and no action because we're not what we say we are going to do <laughs> we're what we do well, alright so I'll be talking to uh, State Minister Ian Hales this morning about the the, the beach situation also uh, Carla Gulato who is a chairperson for the Free Winnipeg, Winifred Beach uh, Benevolent Society uh, for many 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 years has also taken up Winifred Beach in particular as um, a part of a, her advocacy to ensure that there it remains a public beach and that there is access. It has been a long and a bitter fight. You have heard some of it. It has been cantankerous. It has been long. It has been bitter. It is still being dragged out. It is still in the courts because of the resistance. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the resistance from the UDC, which is an agency of government, uh, to keep to make the, to keep this as a public beach, total public beach, that people in Portland can have access to, and not just in Portland, but across Jamaica. It became my advocacy too, because Winifred Beach, since 1990, has been one of the beaches that I usually drive to almost every Sunday afternoon just to go chill from Otrias to Portland and then the destination was always Winifred Beach since 1990. Now, 
um, the people of Portland and the people of Jamaica are in danger of losing access to the beach and this has been going on for some time, being dragged through the courts and so on. And it's a bitter fight. So Carla Gulato, uh, Gulato joins me on the phone lines this morning to give an update on that against the background of and within the context of what we're hearing from Minister State Minister Hales. All right, we've got two Nigerians in the house this morning. <laughs> You know, they're here for something quite different from football. But because they're here, we're going to have to talk football. I don't see how we're going to get over that or across that or by that. So, um, Professor Tunde Biwaji is going to be joining me in the studio. You know, he was one of the chief organizers of the 2014 CBAC Pan-African Conference. They have released their communique and we've talked to Professor Bouwaji about that before, but we're going to be going into some more details this morning. Looking back at the 9th CBAC International Colloquium on the way forward. And I've been reading the colloquium and, you know, this is I'm sorry, I've been reading the communique and what has come out of, of, of a colloquium is very interesting because these are some of the very issues that we have been talking about forever and ever and ever. Amen. And there, there was a big conference at the university that actually underscored some of these very issues in terms of how we move forward, how we go ahead now and go forward uh, with Pan-Africanism and as Pan-Africanists and... Uh, in the best interest of Africans in the diaspora and on the continent of Africa. Also, joining me in the studio this morning is Mary Bolakojo uh, Biwaji, and uh, she is actually the wife of Professor Tunde Biwaji, but she's also the regional director, Region 1 of the Jamaica Library Service, and someone who's going to be assisting us in um, learning, learning, an African language going to be talking to us about that this morning. And as I said before, it's not just going to be like that. <laughs> They're coming in and we're going to be talking football also. All right. I know that we are also going to be making a quick stop in Ghana this morning. We're going to be talking to... Uh, all right, who are we talking to in Ghana? All right, we're going to be talking to Primai uh, in Ghana just to get a feel of what's happening there in Ghana, what the response is like and has been like to uh, Ghana's draw, uh, thrilling draw with Germany last evening. Also in the studio, Mr. Denard Kluvey. Uh, will be joining me in the studio this morning. Former national player for Ghana, 1995 to 1999. Coach of St. Anne Major League Team, Nana FC. And the principal of Tomlinson Christian Academy. He's joining us. And of course, Kanaka Brasilia is on this morning inside of the program. We've got so much to talk about. But here's also another big issue that we're watching and have been talking about in this space. And we're going to be talking about it this morning also. The scramble for Africa is on. And uh, over the last few years, many years, there has been a remarkable rise in the aggressive purchase of large, large swathes of land, arable land, by wealthy states, by wealthy individuals, by multinational corporations, by powerful individuals on and off the continent of Africa and the African diaspora, by wealthy countries. And so the first annual land grab conference is going to be taking place in um, South Africa. The first annual Africa conference on land grabs will be taking place in South Africa this October. Milan Atom is initiator and team leader of the Africa conference on land grabs. He actually lives in South Africa now. But he's from the Cameroon, he's Cameroonian, and we'd probably ask him a quick question about Cameroon uh, in the World Cup. He currently lives in South Africa, but he's lived and worked across the continent of Africa. He's worked and lived in the DRC, the DR Congo, in South Sudan, in Uganda, 
in Swaziland, in Cameroon, of course, and South Africa and Namibia is uh, in between South Africa and the Central African Republic right now. But we are catching him in South Africa this morning to, be free. to talk about the conference, the first Africa conference on land grabs. We want to talk about that. That is also our own experience here in Jamaica that we're seeing a situation with land grabbing. And it's an interesting uh, way that this is play being played out in Jamaica. Because as on the continent of Africa, one of the things we've been saying you know, is that to understand China in Jamaica, we must understand China in Africa. Because they are complicit in the land grab situation. And it's not just China, by the way. Because we know that U.S. universities, can you imagine, universities in the U.S. are also part of this. And the, 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 the bottom line with this land grab situation on the, con on the continent of Africa and in the African diaspora no, is all about food. It's food. It's a food war, as uh, Rastakura would say. It's all about food. It is all about food. We see now in Ethiopia... Where large, large, many, 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 many acres of land are um, now owned by multinational corporations. And they are farming these lands in areas that we have traditionally been told are drought stricken areas. I've been to Ethiopia and I've seen these areas. And, you know, I remember coming back from Ethiopia and saying that what is puzzling to me. As a young journalist, what at the time, what's puzzling to me, most puzzling, was the extent to which y you would find large, large areas, dry and parched and sandy, it would appear, not sandy, but it would appear so, but large areas in Ethiopia that has no green at all. And it tells you no water. But then right beside those large areas, you see, you know, like an acre or two of green vegetables, green plants. They can't be any greener. And my thought has always been that this famine, this drought in Ethiopia is man-made. And Ethiopians bought into it. Because at the same time, the River Nile starts in Ethiopia. One of the countries in which the River Nile starts is in Ethiopia. But if you go down to Egypt, where the Nile empties, uh, sorry, yeah, where the Nile empties, the, the river Lake Tana empties into the River Nile. So Lake Tana is in Ethiopia and empties into the River Nile. Uh, the Blue Nile empties into the, the Nile all the way up <laughs> to Egypt. Uh, but if you go there, you'll find that. You know, Egypt, there's a desert and there is a green. And there, there's no conversation or discussion about famine in Egypt. So how come? Well, now we're knowing for true that this was all uh, a man-made situation. So we're talking about the conference on land grabs that's going to be happening in South Africa come October. We're very interested in that. There's going to be a dialogue first. There's going to be a dialogue in... In South Africa, I think there's another dialogue in in Kenya, and uh, we really should get one going here in Jamaica and be a part of these conversations on land grabbing. We have to talk about it, you know. We can't just sit back and watch it happen and then turn around and ask ourselves, what happened? How did this happen? Where were we? We were here, but we were sleeping. So we've got lots and lots to talk about this morning inside of the Africa Forum. Reuniting the African Family for Development. Bearing witness. Bearing witness. We have talked about that, what it means to bear witness. We have continued to talk about that because bearing witness is a responsibility. And once you know, you're going to have to do something. So that's why we say bearing witness, demanding change, and developing our own African-centered agenda for change as we blaze new paths towards Africa's rendezvous we with destiny. All right, we keep playing that. The ancestors want to come through, but uh, we're going to let them through. <laughs> we're going to let them through. First, we have to take a break. Now, uh, nine minutes going up to seven o'clock. Rise up, rise up, stop the corruption Integrity we want in our nation Corruption is a virus that spread to everyone So hold up your head and be strong Bad mind and fear Corruption that 
Latina with society It's up and stop Miss honest people It's up and stop Teasing people It's up and stop Extortion people It's up and stop It's up and stop So go to right when you take no shortcut Don't follow them and get caught up When you see corruption you feel stuck up Integrity Ambassadors stand up The president was brought to you by the Integrity Ambassadors of Holy Trinity High School and a message from NIA and JCSC. Speak truth to the people. To identify the enemy is to free the mind. Free the mind of the people. Speak to the mind of the people. Speak truth. Yeah. Who gave the authority to vent our poor people property war? Who gave the authority to vent our Jamaican property war? He said, to the JFP we talking, to the BFP we talking, to free up Jaja land. Yes, to the government we want it, the politicians we want it, to free poor people land. Boy. Who gave the authority? Who gave the authority, indeed, who gave the authority to fence off poor people property to the JLP we're talking, to the PNP we're talking, the brother is right. Good question, my brother, good question. Who gave the authority? It's a situation that we have been dealing with here in Jamaica and it's escalating because while we talk about the seashore, while we talk about the beach, while we talk about access to the water, there's also a land grab situation that's happening here in Jamaica. And all of this, you know, the access to the beach or the exclusion from the beach area has to do with issues pertaining to land. Ownership, land, access. And it's interesting, and we're very happy that the state minister in the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate Change has recognized that this is an issue of land, announcing in Parliament that government will be developing a comprehensive beach access and management policy that will enshrine access to beaches for Jamaicans into law. And that is brilliant. We like that. Uh, once again, though, I was around as a young journalist in high school. I covered the, and I'm talking about very young journalists in high school, not to reach form yet. You know, I covered the Paget Beach, the building of the the um, the development and the development of the Paget Beach in St. Mary. No, St. Mary people know, and they'll call and tell me that that is gone to the dogs because there was a change in government and uh, one government started and the other abandoned and Paget Beach is now being eyed by big developers and we're hearing under the guise of environmental issues we're hearing conversations about moving people from that area to somewhere else right because those people all of a sudden are in about moving people from that area to somewhere else right because those people all of a sudden are in danger of flooding give me a break so we don't want it to be just about talk all right quick break and we'll be right back with the minister now a minute after seven, we're going to go to the phone lines to speak with State Minister and the Minister uh, Ministry of Water, Land and the Environment and Climate Change, Ian Hales, who, as I said before, announced in Parliament recently that uh, there's going to be a change. And we like that change as it relates to the Beach Control Act, as it relates to um, access to beaches here in Jamaica. So we're standing by to speak with Ian Hales. The minister and uh, minister of water, land, and the environment. Now, five minutes after seven o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It's running African, and we go to the phone lines now. Where State Minister and the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment, and Climate Change, Ian Hales, is standing by. Minister Hales, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us on the Africa Forum. Good morning, Andrea. Let me say thanks for having me. All right. All right. Um, interesting uh, developments, and we welcome but these before, developments. Be before, yes. before I start out, I must apologize to I made a small mistake in Parliament last week, and 
I just want to start out by correcting that mistake, and I hopefully in the near future I'll also correct it in Parliament. Yes. And that is to say that this is a fight that you've been carrying for years without, at times, any help from anyone. And I just want to say on behalf of the Jamaican people, we appreciate what you're doing in terms of creating a level of awareness and ensuring that people across this country have access to what's rightfully ours, and that's the beaches within our borders and in our shores, within our shores. Thank you very much, Minister Hales. Uh, interesting, and, and we like what we're hearing in Parliament in terms of <laughs> the developments. Uh, but before we get to what the plans are, um, <clears throat> please help us to understand what the situation is currently as it regards to access to beaches by ordinary Jamaicans here on the island. Well, it's a big problem, Jay. It's a big problem. It's something that we get complaints basically almost every day or regular. And, and that is Jamaicans who want to go to the beach with family and friends to just enjoy a day find it one of the most impossible things to do within our country. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is wrong and it's something that this policy seeks to address. And from my own personal experience, I would say approximately two years ago, I decided to walk the seven-mile strip in the grill. And I was wearing a baseball hat. And at some point, I felt a little tired and decided to rest. Mm -hmm. And somebody came along to basically ask me to move along. Okay. And and it's, it's something that speaks to me personally. And, I mean, after I removed my hat and the gentleman, so who I was, he told me to basically stay and, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. relax. But if it was any other person, um, they would have to keep on walking. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, 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 it's personal. And, and for example, I, I mean, I live in a coastal constituency where there's a lot of beaches here, but access, I mean, access to the beach keeps on getting blocked, I would say, on almost all the entire seven miles in Negril, I think there's only two access now, and it's from the Long Bay 1 and Long Bay 2 property in Negril. I think every other access is blocked from the 7.2 kilometers of beach in Negril. Mm -hmm. And it is something that just not only affects Negril, mm -hmm. but it affects the entire country. And it's something that will be addressed this year by government. Because it seems to me that, uh, it, and as you said, this is replicated across Jamaica, across the island. Uh, we remember as young people going on school trips, you know, from St. Mary, we're from St. Mary High, mm -hmm. and we're traveling to Negril. Uh, one of the big draws is, you know, walking that seven miles of, mm -hmm. of, of beach. Now, you, you managed to at least be on a place where you were tr attempting to walk that two years ago. We can't, mm -hmm. we can't even get to attempt to walk that so you, you 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 actually had a kind of advantage that a lot of us d didn't even have without, without being recognized so that but I'm saying, and here on the coast in St. Anne, uh, St. Mary, we say from Portland uh, to, to Negril, this is the problem we're facing. How, how come, though, what is it in law, what is it in the Constitution, what is, what is it legally that allows somebody to be able to give permission for that to happen, for access to it, the beaches to be blocked? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not a matter of anyone having that right or that permission, you know. No one has that right or permission to block a Jamaican or any other citizen from the beaches within our shores. Mm -hmm. But I think there are individuals who, I mean, you always hear it, that boy, you know, they come on, they come on our beaches and they, they harass the guests. Now, there is a place for that also, for that to be dealt with. Mm. And that is dealt with by the police. But I think ordinary decent citizens within our borders who want to go to the beach or to walk the beach, those individuals constantly find it an obstacle where they can go out and walk the beaches across this country, whether it is to exercise or just to look how beautiful our country is, because it is. 
they find it very difficult. I want to and back up a bit. I want to back up a mm -hmm. bit, Minister, because you said no one has that right. There's nothing enshrined mm -hmm. in law that allows mm -hmm. someone to deny access to beaches. But mm -hmm. we have multinational corporations, hotels, we have private individuals and, and others um, mm -hmm. who, who do that. So are you saying that legally they have no right to do that? Legally they have no right to do that. So what is the right of a citizen like myself who wants <laughs> the right to... Of a, the, yeah. the, 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 right, the right of a citizen within the country is that you have the right to all beaches across this country. Um, the beaches across this country does not belong to anyone per se. It belongs to the people of Jamaica. And one of the things I want to stress on is that there's 86 beaches across the country. We manage 33. And by we, you mean the... the and NRCA. Uh -huh. NRCA manages 33, and the rest basically is private. But this policy seeks to address all 86. Uh -huh. It addresses all 86. All right, let us talk about the policy. What What is uh -huh. the policy going to change then? What, what What are you seeking to do okay. in this policy? Well, what, we're, what, what, what we're seeking to do, A, is first to provide access to the beach for sure, see on a managed basis to the public of Jamaica. That's one. Secondly, we intend to, for example, you have also where the fisher folks are also upset about not having access to certain beaches, to beach their fishing vessel across the country. That has to be dealer, dealt with also within the policy. Mm -hmm. So it's basically seeking to do two things. Giving Jamaicans their rightful access to the beaches across this country, one, and two, providing access to the fisher folks across this country. Mm -hmm. We all can, it, it, it can be done, and I, I know you're going to have some people that are going to say, well, more harassment is going to come when this policy is instituted. Mm -hmm. As I said, there's a place where you deal with harassment in this country and that's the law yes but for the decent abiding citizens across this country who want to enjoy something that is rightfully theirs mm -hmm. we want to go back and whether it is in the grill center or wherever it is across the country is to provide access to the people of jamaica we have think it's it's something that has to be addressed now as i said you have been carrying this fight for a long time and, uh, mm. let me say, Andrea, Andrea, a lot of people listen to your program. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and, <laughs> yes. and, and, and they put pressure on government mm. in addressing these problems because it concerns all of us. Yes. Um, because <laughs> today you're in government, tomorrow you're out of government. And it might be just you as a citizen tomorrow who will be faced with and this sort of challenge going and, forward. And that point is a brilliant one because as I, just before you came on, I talked about as a young journalist in high school writing for the news, for the Daily Gleaner, um, mm -hmm. discovered by Franklin McNight, I might just add. But, <laughs> right, but <laughs> writing for the Daily Gleaner, that what, I remember one of the assignments that I had um, mm -hmm. was so the, the, the buildings that were being put up on Paget Beach because the government at the time, I don't even remember who was the government at the time, but they were um, developing the Paget Beach in St. Mary and people mm -hmm. were very, very excited about that but before I completed that story there was an election and mm. and I still go to Paji Beach I mean if I'm passing by there I still drive on to Paji Beach I still go on a big tree go eat but the thing with Paji Beach now is that all those buildings have been abandoned because what the government that came in did was to just dump that 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 entire development and mm. and and it's now we're hearing that they're going to be that thinking of uh, selling it to private interests and so on. We have a situation in Winifred, uh, in Portland, Winifred Beach, uh, 1990, uh, you know, for, for years and years, from 1990 all the way to about 95, 96, 97, I used to finish this program and just jump into my car and head for Portland, just go sit down on Winifred Beach with a man and man them and eat fish and so on. Now, th th now well, I'm saying this because Winifred Beach, there's a bitter situation now in the court where the UDC is saying, no, we, this is, it's no longer a public beach. As, as a matter of fact, I think that they have already sold it. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what kind of resistance do you anticipate from tourism interest, from the UDC, and from others? Well, well, well the UDC is a part of this administration, and I wouldn't, me. I wouldn't say that from a standpoint of joint-up government. 
we will work with the UDC in terms of ensuring that either Jamaicans have access. I think if there are breaches that have taken place, already find those breaches have taken place, but it's a breach that has to be addressed. Yes. And we're willing as a ministry to meet with all stakeholders, but this is something that we will be doing. We have to give our people access, their God-given right, to the beaches across this country what about so that they can. What about tourism interests? Um, tourism interests are going to have a concern, and I think the biggest concern is from the standpoint of harassment in terms of their guests. But to all the beaches that have walked, both in Negril and across Jamaica, there's always a security guard there. And at times you'll see the police patrolling the beaches across this country. But Minister... No, uh, no, 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 I am saying if, if it is that the security guard can come over and tell you to keep on walking, that same security guard can also tell you that in terms of the level of harassment, they will not tolerate it on the beach. But what I am... It, it seeks to address some things. As a country, our people have rights to certain things. Yes. It's not it's not given by man. It it is their God given right to have access to certain things. And as a society, we have to provide that avenue where all people can go at time and relax with their family and mm -hmm. friends mm -hmm. and share and uh, share within their country and feel proud and good about it. Yes. Not to be turned around and be harassed by private interests are others who deny you access to the beaches across this country and it is something that we will be dealing with and, and, and hopefully when we start in terms of the public consultation side of it that Jamaicans will turn out in terms of supporting the ministry and government in allowing us to make certain changes that will benefit all of us in the long run. Well, talk to us about that public consultation side. What, what, what's the process now of getting to the point of uh, enshrining into policy access well, to well, 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 in terms of what we are doing now, in terms of when the policy is completed sometime this year, mm -hmm. um, the next step is to go out and to do public consultation in terms of what we plan on doing. Yes. Therein lies we are all the stakeholders stakeholders in terms of tourism, in terms of whether it is UDC or anyone, plus the public can come out and voice their opinion, yeah. and we then take take it from there, and then enshrine it where every Jamaican, public and private, will know the rights of every Jamaican, and it will be clear in terms of what we will be doing in going forward. So the public consultation is one of the most important aspects of it. Okay. Um, and we intend to do that later this year after the policy. Right. But we have to give our people access. Right, and you say after the policy, so the policy you expect to be to be in effect by? The end of this year. Okay. Um, we're going to start in terms of um, in terms of the public consultation later this year and hopefully by the end of this year we can have something in place where everybody can know what their rights are. Well, because Minister, it's something that basically affects all of us. Minister, I'd like to uh, give to you at this minute. First of all, to commend you on, mm -hmm. on, on moving this uh, in the way that you've been doing, but also to give you our support and to say that you have, uh, in terms of doing this public consultations and, and, and other stuff that you have to do in getting this off the ground and getting this into law, um, the, the vehicle which is IRFM uh, behind you. So please use us. We are ready okay. to be used um, as okay. far as this is concerned. And, anyway, and, 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 and let yeah. me say, Andrea, anything yeah. you need to do in the future, we stand ready as a ministry and myself in basically, if it is to educate the people across the country what their rights are or whatever it is, even before the public consultation, yes. um, we stand ready to work in with you also. And, 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 you know, words can't explain in terms of commending you and basically looking at what affects our people. And for IRFM to, to allow in you uh, to do what you do in terms of bringing public awareness to, to, to different interests across this country that affects our people daily. And I thank you on behalf of the people of Jamaica for that. You're welcome. Thank you, Minister. I also want to talk a little bit just before you go, um, which is a final mm -hmm. question, about the... 
uh, announcement made by the Minister of Tourism recently um, regarding uh, public uh, parks, beach parks and so on, developing, making one beach in, the, in each community, a public beach and so on. How does that fit into the policy? It, it, fit, it fits excellent because mm -hmm. I think if you look at our infrastructure across the country, the public, and you speak about it earlier in terms of what our people use, I mean, they, some of them are run down basically and, and, and needs in terms of refurbishment and, and one or two, you find in cases where, you know, some work needs to be done in terms of aesthetics, in terms of allowing it to look good. So when you go there, you can have fun and you feel comfortable using a bathroom or the facilities. Yeah. And I think what the minister, McNeil, has come forward and said, I, I commend him for it. It's about time we give the public it's about time we give the public some good facilities across this country and access to the beach. And this administration is committed to ensuring that we give the public access and we give them a part of the tourism dollar in terms of the Tourism Enhancement Fund dollar in ensuring that certain things can get done, whether it is access, A, or B, ensuring that when they've got the facilities are of world-class standards so that they can enjoy themselves. All right. Um, brilliant work, uh, State Minister in the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate Change. Uh, we're working with you on this and we hope to see uh, that dream realized by the end of the year, as you uh, said just now. So this yep. this is looking good uh, for Jamaicans. This is looking very, very good. We'll ensure that you do it, you know, Senate Min Minister, Minister Hills. Well, 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 well Andrea, <laughs> I'm fighting for it. Because as I said to you, it's something that affects me also. Yes, yes. And it is something that when I look within my constituency, even the areas where the public have, have access, if you go there now, you'll see 10 feet chain link wire fence blocking the public from having access to the beaches. Mm. Mm. And it is something that we're dealing with. As Bob Marley says, all of us. as Bob Marley says, Ja is the Earth's rightful ruler and he wants no wire fence. Wire fence. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Mr. God bless. Yes, all right. Okay. Good, good. Okay, uh, State Minister in the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate Change. Going to be speaking with Carla Gulata right after this. 23 after 7, uh, standing by to speak with Carla Gulata, said, uh, State Minister of the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate Change. Ian Hill spoke about uh, the plans that government have to develop a comprehensive beach access and management policy that will enshrine access to beaches for Jamaicans into law. The main goals, as you heard to provide physical access to the beach, foreshore and the sea on a managed basis to the general public, to increase opportunities for recreational use of the beach and coastal areas in an environmentally sound manner. It also aims to protect the traditional rights of fishermen, which is very, very important. And our listeners in Germany, Mama Sita Talawa on IRFM.net and our listeners are on the internet in Germany and the Netherlands, you'll be very, very happy to hear this because one of the things that you have been writing in on the social media about in um, uh, Free the Beach um, webpage on Facebook is that what's happening with access to fishermen. So it also aims to protect traditional rights of fishermen to access the foreshore and the sea as well as their rights to safe harbour and the beaching of vessels and you heard that there are currently 86 public beaches of which the NRCA, the Natural Resources Conservation Authority has management responsibility for 33 but they're including all 86, some of them are privately uh, managed and uh, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing this come to fruition, uh, Carla Gulata, who has been fighting a hard fight in Portland uh, and, and also the chairman of a Free Winifred Beach Benevolent Society, joins me on the phone lines. My sister Carla, welcome. How are you? Good morning, morning. I'm fine. Right. I'm I happy to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I haven't seen you in a long time, but we know how it is. All right. Um, Carla, here we are now. Um, we've had some responses in recent times, one from the Minister of Tourism and now from the Ministry of Land and the Environment uh, regarding access to beaches. But there is still the situation with Winifred Beach that I refer to as a long, drawn-out and bitter war for public access uh, and, and for, for the public holding on to a beach that belonged to the public for many, many moons. Give us an update. First of all, a background for listeners and then an update as to where we are now. 
The, thank you Andrea. The background is that Winifred Beach in Portland, in the community of Ferril, has been forever a public beach and it has been a sort of heritage place where people are gathering. Uh, the other beaches in the, the area is a tourist area, tourist resort. They have some fees uh, to access. Just to give an example, Frenchman Cove Beach, you pay 1,000 Jamaican dollars per person. If you're Jamaican, you pay a little less, but it's still pretty high. Um, the beach has been donated by a gentleman to the community of Ferriel, fishermen, churches, and elders, and there was a trust administrating the beach. Nobody is able to say it with a certain way what happened, but in uh, 1976, the trust, uh, the administrator of the trust sold the beach to UDC. The reason why was because they didn't pay property tax. Um, since then, we have kept interviewing some of the trustees which were telling us that they didn't know anything about there was no meeting no public meeting no nothing so that agreement has has involved the beach and a, a huge lot of land around the beach which became UDC property mm -hmm. since then for many years nothing happened and I, I think that most of the people in there they didn't even know that the, the owner is, was not the trust anymore mm -hmm. until five years ago there was a notice on the on a tree uh, at the entrance of the beach where the UDC was notifying vendors to evacuate the beach within two weeks. Mm. Um, on the beach there are a lot of people, uh, stalls, craft, restaurant, jerk fish, jerk chicken, soup, whatsoever, right? And it's a huge amount of families which make their liberty out from the beach. From Some of them are there since 30 years and more. So that was making everybody get in panic. Um, they came to me, uh, which I use the beach because it's near to my house and I grow my children there. Um, and we decided to do to do something. We didn't know what kind of action to do at the moment because I am a human rights expert and not an environmental expert, but we were learning. And we got a tremendous help from somebody, which I want to mention, which is John Maxwell. He's not here anymore, but he has been inspiring us a lot and acting with us yes, a lot. Yes. Uh, since then... First of all, we realized that we were needing to become a sort of formal entity. You mentioned before Free Winifred Benevolent Society. This is what we did, became a benevolent society to represent ourselves and the need and the wishes and the stress of the people in the area. Uh, and since then, we are fighting uh, because Mr. Maxwell was telling us that if a beach is public for 25 years without an interruption, it cannot be made private. We got statements from people using elders using the beach since a long, long time, and we brought UDC to court. Mm. We are still in court, Andrew, after five years. And honestly, I am extremely worried because a public beach in Jamaica is not what most of the people think like a free beach. Mm -hmm. A public beach is only a beach that as far as you can pay your entrance fee, nobody can evict you from there. Mm. But it's still a beach with a fence, a ticket, a, an entrance fee uh, and stuff. Mm -hmm. Winifred is the most, uh, to me, is one of the most beautiful places in Jamaica. Yes, it is. And uh, because it has a personality. It's a Jamaican beach, you understand me? Mm -hmm. Like you go there and you can, you can play a little music, you can play football, mm -hmm. you can feel nice, the famous vibes. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, is very much appreciated by visitors and tourists. Mm -hmm. which uh, wonder why w they have been se sent to beaches where there is only tourists and they would love to stay with Jamaicans and learn a bit about food, culture, whatsoever. And it's full, full 
there, there are, I send you some pictures on Easter Monday. I don't know if you got them. No, no. Well, we had a beach party. And believe you me, you couldn't even sit down for the amount of people which were on the beach. Wow. Maybe it was a little too much. Yes, because, because I haven't seen them. But I will send them yes, again. Yes, please. But Carla, so, so, so the situation, and this is interesting, because here you're talking about a public space uh, in Portland that traditionally has been a place for people, not just um, Jamaicans, but also visitors, uh, to just lime, to chill, to cool, uh, to interact and to mingle, and to do so peacefully. And that has been happening for years. I started doing it in 1990, and you know, you know the history that people have been doing it many, many years before that. Right. So, but, but that now it's under threat uh, and, and has been in the court, the fight. This has been taken to the court. It's in the court now for the last five years. So, so when is the next court date? Where are we? I mean, what's the situation with that? Why is it in the courts for five years? Okay, the, the, the court case is still there because on one side... I want to be very straight and very honest. We are not pushing. Because once, once we push, we risk to lose the case. On the other side, UDC has changing the board, the, 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 code, the director of the board, and sometimes I have the feeling that even for them, it's not so easy to take a final decision. We went to mediate. We did two sessions of mediations trying to find a solution. The solution was possible because we could have a, a, have a committee, a joint committee with UDC, ourselves, other local entities, for example, the, the, the community of Firil, the parish council and whatsoever, which could have been a good, a good way to handle the situation. After we, we were sitting there for eight hours and got totally crazy, uh, when we got the draft, in the draft there was written that the committee was a consultative committee, which means the last word is still to the owner, UDC. So I don't want to sit down on a committee, discuss, draft a plan, and then hear that, no, 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 I don't like it, and mm -hmm. you, you can chat as much as you want. This is my mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So we are still in court. We are going to go back on, in September, if I'm not wrong, the 14. Um, meantime, a little light, I see a little light at the end of the tunnel with the statement from the Minister, minister of Tourism, yes. which is, was stating that each parish should have a public beach. Right. I, I welcome that. I welcome that. And I hope that Andrea Williams and IDFM, with their powers, can interview the minister and try to find out. We have been trying to get the minister. I know the last time we tried, there was a recording on his telephone that says he was out of Ireland and will be back today. So okay. hopefully, hopefully we'll have him uh, on um, very, very soon. We have been trying to get to him. We really want to talk to him about this. And we just heard um, Minister Hale say that um, the, 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 what the minister announced in terms of the public beach and the parks and so on fits ve nicely into um, what the Ministry of uh, Land and the Environment are thinking about also in terms of the public policy, what they plan to do. So, so it's you see, no some, sometimes you, you struggle and struggle and struggle. Mm -hmm. um, um, I know how small we are. I mean, it's a community yes. thing, right? Yes. But the amount of noise that we have made in the last five years is quite striking. Yes. And I hope that together with the other places, because I don't forget the, the, the little beach near to you. No, that's um, Little Duns River. Right. And, and so many other beaches across And Mami Bay. And Mami some other Bay, yes. Mm -hmm. We're hearing about one in Clarendon this morning. I'm not sure. Jackson Beach, I'm not sure about that. But we somebody can call us and tell us what's happening with that beach in Clarendon. Good. Um, I think uh, we should we should yes. go above the single beaches and try to right. unite all together and try of to course. get something if, which is course. for the full island. Um, I hope that one plus one plus one will make two thousand right. because uh, we we need to have voice because sometimes the people love to lament it, but then action is very weak. We are not who we say we are; we are what we do. Exactly, and and, and there is there is a free free the beach. Uh, 
coalition that is very very strong and and not just local uh it it has mushroom to to the continent uh, of europe to the continent of africa and so many persons are in on this um you know jamaican communities overseas and so on that i think you know this is strength in numbers now let us do Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, my sister uh, Carla. Uh, looking forward to talking to you very soon again. I hope you come into the studio when we have the minister. Um, yes, of yes, course. Yes. You let me know. <laughs> we'll do. All right, Carla, what good? You are a wonderful Sunday. You, you and too. all the IDFM people. All right, you too. Blessings. All right, chairperson for the Free Winifred Beach uh, Benevolent Society and executive director for Stand Up Jamaica, Carla Gulacha, who has been on this issue for a very, very long time. We keep saying beaches are not a luxury. Beaches are a public space that provide a different set of rhythms to renew public life. Beaches are a democratic commons that brings people together as equals. And it is when people can swim and splash in the waves and, and surf and, you know, everybody come in the same water. Uh, it it, it kind of brings the thing down to an equal thing. So there's no colorism there's democracy and equality there's no classism like Rio de, Rio de Janeiro for example you know um, some of the beaches in Brazil this is where um, all the class barriers and all the color barriers are broken down because you know people just go to the beach and when we say go to the beach you know it is go to freedom it is go to liberation it is go to access it is go to inclusion the beach is a symbol it's not just sand and see, it's much more like that, much more than that. So we're talking about what it represents, even as we talk about emancipation. Who gave the authority to fend off poor people property war? Who gave the authority to fend off Jamaican property war? He said, who gave the authority? All right, in the next segment of the program, we're going to be talking to Professor Tunde Biwaji on CBAC, and we're talking about the communique, looking at that. Also, uh, going to be talking quickly some football in all of that. All right, uh, on Twitter, just want to say good morning to uh, the folks who are listening and tweeting to Win C5, Win Some Chambers. Big up to you, my girl, also. Big up to you, too, Winnie. And uh, to Michelle, Sonia Stanley Naya, and uh, Aldis Hunka. Thank you very much for uh, checking in and tweeting and being a part of the program uh, this morning. At Pacheri, good morning. Hope you're listening in. We just uh, mentioned the beach in Clarendon, but we hope that uh, someone listening there in Clarendon can give us an idea as to what's happening with the beach at uh, Jackson Bay. Yeah. Um, Sonia Stanley did say that she... Uh, she went there and it seems that it's still a public beach but if you have any ideas as to what's happening there please let me know and any other uh, beach in your area we've heard a lot from the people in the Negril area in Hanover and so on from time to time who have called us about what's happening there with their own beaches here in St. Anne, uh, St. Mary, Portland, uh, along the coastline of Jamaica, we're having issues. And just to quickly say that we are still waiting to hear from the Ministry of Culture whether or not there is an Emancipation Day celebration this year or has it been co-opted by Denby Agricultural Show um, that is what we heard Senator Norman Grant saying uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we carry that um, back on this program, taking it from the IRFM newsroom. It was first broadcast uh, there. Uh, we're very concerned about that. We want to know what's happening. And uh, we haven't. Uh, when we were on then... Uh, we were also talking about the 100 years of Garveyism and we were told that, um, you know, we had done no investigations and there were plans to do and to have um, events and programs around both emancipation and on 100 years of Garveyism and we were told that that information would be sent to us. Well, we have not received that information yet so that we're waiting, standing by for that. Please let us know what's happening with emancipation let us know what's happening in terms of 100 years of Garveyism.
now 7.40, now 7.45, you're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African. And in this segment of the program, very, very interesting discussion uh, that we're going to be having with our recurring and returning guests and a family member of the Africa Forum, Professor Tunde Biwaji. And we're very happy to have with us in the studio uh, today the wife of Professor Tunde Biwaji. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, we have been talking to Professor Biwaji for many, many, many moons and uh, just recently uh, met uh, Mrs. Mary uh, Bolakoja Biwaji. Thank you very much both for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having good us. Morning. Good morning. All right. Very good. Uh, very good to have you in the studio. Uh, Professor Bawaji, we're going to be looking at the communique uh, and the recommendations coming out of the CBAC uh, colloquium. And then with Mrs. Bawaji, we're going to be talking a little bit about African languages. And I hope that when we are through, she'll just say to us, you know what? We'll do that course with you right here on IMFM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, before we do that, though, congratulations. Oh. Are you still celebrating? <laughs> I mean, you mean the <laughs> win against uh, Bosnia? Yes. <laughs> well, I think it was a very good uh, performance yes. that uh, the Green Eagles, the Super Eagles put up. And many people would have been surprised. But with the match between Argentina and Iran... I think the blame that we placed on the Super Eagles, you know, in their match with yes, Iran, yes. we dissipated. I think so. Uh, I think because so, yes. Iran came with a game plan which was to frustrate attack. Yes. And it worked for 91 minutes against uh, Argentina. Mm-hmm. It was only one lapse of concentration that led to the goal, yes, which yes. saw, you know, their defeat. Now, the game with uh, Bosnia, between Nigeria and Bosnia now, um, you know, both teams played some free-flowing football, which should have seen many goals. Yes, true. But poor finishing, you know, on both sides, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, robbed them of uh, scoring until the, the goal which Nigeria scored, uh, and that was, you know, played in from the right flank, you know, when Emenike ran through the wings yes. and then crossed, you know, he was strong enough to beat the defender. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And many people were suggesting that the, there was an infringement, but there was none. Because, you know, the, the no, defender, there was none. I, 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 the defender I'm, I'm was not trying to play. The defender wasn't yes. trying to play the ball. Right. All he was trying to do was to impede the progress, yes. you know, of Emenike. And Emenike managed to shrug him off and cross the ball in. Mm-hmm. And his, his one-time shot was what beat the goalkeeper. If the, the, if the attacker, you know, that is Odemingue, if he had tried to control the ball instead of shooting at the same time, probably the, the game, the, the goal wouldn't have, uh, have been you know, yeah. Because we saw that earlier, yes. I think it was, was it with Cote d'Ivoire that we saw a similar situation, even though they won? Yes. Where they could have scored, but then there was a, there was a trying to control. But but listen, yeah. uh, we're still celebrating. Yes. You know, um, <laughs> we think this, it's beautiful. So Nigeria now has four points. Yes. Uh, the only one with uh, six is Argentina. Mm-hmm. Uh, effectively, Bosnia is gone. You know, uh, Bosnia is is out of the competition because yes, yes, they have yes. lost. Two. They sent them home. Nigeria yes. sent them home. Yes. yes. So yes. it now remains Iran. Yes. And um, it's you know one would hope that uh, which whatever the outcome of that. If Nigeria manages a draw against Argentina, then they will have uh, five points. Right. And there's nothing saying that they cannot beat Argentina because they have beaten Argentina before. And they can. Yes. And they seemed, they seemed, I know you you, you talked about, you know, lost chances and so on, but Nigeria seemed a bit more focused to me uh, this time around. Oh, they played really better. They, you know, the previous game against Iran, you didn't see movement on the ball. You know, they were not providing passing chances. They were just hiding behind their opponents, yes, yes. which made passing difficult. 
But in this game now, you saw a totally different uh, play, which mm -hmm. which I think was very significant. It was. Uh, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't get over it. I, yesterday was a good day for football. <laughs> <laughs> and then you saw how, how, how Ghana... Yes. You know, drill with uh, the, the the other team. Uh, with, know, with Germany. Yeah. And you know, that last goal from Germany it should not have happened. Yeah, it should have. You know, because um, it's, it's, you see, the game is usually played for 90 minutes plus extra. Yeah. If you don't retain your concentration for the 90 minutes, anything can happen. Yes. You know. Yes. That, that's, that's what happened uh, even with, uh, with uh, Cote d'Ivoire. You saw the game against Cote d'Ivoire. The way they lost the last uh, match was because of that kind of lapse of uh, concentration mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. you know, a back pass didn't work quite well yes, and then yes. the, the, the attacker latched onto it and, and scored. But uh, we really enjoyed it yesterday yeah. and uh, we have Kinaka Brasilia coming up later on where yeah. Roger Haspal will be joining me on the phone lines for this because this has to be totally live. And we hope to go to Ghana. We've been trying to get to Gold FM, Radio Gold FM in Ghana where um, Prime Eye is supposed to be standing by just to give us a feel as to what's happening there in Ghana, how people are feeling. And uh, there is kind of a, a renewed hope among the um, the African uh, teams because after the first um, few you know few days uh, people are feeling like wow where is this going yeah. I never gave up hope may I just say yes, <laughs> at no know. time did I give up hope but uh, brilliant we love it yeah. and, and, and Mrs. Biwaji did you yes. watch I did <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wouldn't tell you what I went through before the end of the game <laughs> I know I could listen I woman to woman I couldn't watch the last three minutes no honestly I was I literally watched it with my eyes closed those last three minutes were tense moments yes, yeah, uh, for yeah. me all right we really enjoyed um, yesterday mm, thank you. but we're, we're here to talk about a few things mm. and uh, because our listeners are already familiar with uh, Professor Tunde Biwaji, who, by the way, has to come back <laughs> uh, to, to, to talk some more about this because of time. Uh, a little bit about about yourself, uh, Mrs. Biwaji, because your 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 you major actually in African languages. Am I right? Yes, I was teaching African language Yoruba in particular at home. Mm -hmm. All right, and so that it is something that for 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 a class, say a, a, a radio audience, which is no, a no, class. No. Uh, well, well, give us a few words then. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I did my teacher education in Yoruba language and history, mm -hmm. and I taught from grades. We call it forms. The first form to the fifth form. In Yoruba okay. language, okay. and okay. the different aspect of Yoruba, the tonation, uh, everything about Yoruba was taught, and the, the African religion, because there is difficult to separate religion and the language oh. but you just have to manage it based on your religion because I usually tell them that I'm a Christian and when I get to African religion I explain that I have to teach you but I'm not preaching it to you mm -hmm. That's what and why is it so difficult to, to separate the language from the religion? Uh, <laughs> there are some aspects of the religion that are embedded in the language. Let's say that we are talking about the, uh, we are teaching something about Ogun. Ogun is a god in Af in Nigeria, in Yor Yoruba aspect of Nigeria. And when you are talking about it, you have to teach all the aspects of the worshipping of Ogun. And it is part of the Yoruba language. It cannot be separated. It has to be taught. Mm -hmm. I want to understand that some more. You see, and this is what I and because it, it's interesting to me because we talk all the time about the need to deconstruct uh, the language uh, if we are going to and I talk about the English language okay. if we are going to understand and find ourselves uh, because there is racism in the languages, classism, discrimination, and so on, uh, and and part of that also has to do with Christianity in terms of how Christianity view um, the you know um, slavery and 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 enslavement. And and so on, and even the Bible itself, what it teaches you about um, sub subjection and, and subjugation, and so on. So that, uh, how does this is is that a similar thing with Yoruba and say um, and the language in terms of what can what what how can the language affect and impact a person's thinking 
uh, of yourself, of how you see yourself? Okay. Uh, the culture is also part of the language. And when you are talking about the language now, the perception of people about the total human being of a Yoruba person will come into play. The culture will, the way you even teach the language will be expressed in the form of the culture that you are living in. Yes. When I go home, the way I talk to people is different from the way I talk here. I know that at home I can relate to people very closely. I can call you and say that, oh, you cannot carry your baby like that. That is part of our culture that I express in my language. Yes. And here I know that whether you carry your baby upside down, I cannot just call you back and say, oh, you are not carrying your baby the way you should carry it. So w the way I speak it mm -hmm. to people mm -hmm. is also part of my language and the culture. All right. This is very important. This is very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll bring Professor uh, Biwaji in because I think even when we talk about this new Pan-Africanism, we have to look at the language because it seems to me as if part of uh, for Africans in the diaspora we have a totally different experience because we are speaking to and in a culture that is alien uh, to us um, as um, uh, Bola is just saying Yoruba language does not isolate atomize individuals it's a language that is respectful of relationships and because it is respectful of relationships, it builds on relationships. Consequently, you know, you cannot just, when you say Oma, that is child, the child is not just the biological child of the person who, who has delivered the baby. No, it's just the biological child of the husband. So it is, you know, it is understood it, in the word. Yes, yeah, so it yes. is a collective child. Well, I'm getting goose pimples. I think we need to go back to, yeah, we'll go forward to our language. It I, it's, I'm, you, you see the difference, and let me just interrupt. Yeah. The difference between you and, and, and Mrs. Bawaji and, and myself, you know, is that for both of you, I don't even know if you're understanding the extent to which what this means for me, and I'm sure for our listeners, who do not speak an African language, who know that our culture is embodied in our language language but we but english is not our culture you know america is not our culture yeah. our culture and who we are is african and if that if if we are devoid of an african language then to the at the core of our being is is a vacancy that probably uh, you know can be uh, we, we can attribute some of the violence some of the relationships how we deal with each other to 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 that yes. to that disconnect Okay. Look, looking at the interpersonal relationship, Yoruba culture on, and language is very rich in that. You cannot just address somebody who is older than you or who has an authority on you and say, Iwo, that is you. And in English culture, language, you can all just say you. Same. And if you look at the Spanish also, they have some sort of respect mm -hmm. for authority and elders. Yoruba, you cannot just talk to anybody anyhow. There, is, there are ways of talking to individuals. So in terms of addressing our elders, for example, um, you know, you in, in, in English, you say you for anybody in, in addressing anyone. Yes. Okay, whether it's a baby or the elder yes. or the male yeah, or the female. It's a disrespectful <laughs> language. It's a disrespectful language. You know, and, uh, yes. and, and as she's saying, you see, the, what we have recognized over which the researchers have shown is that language is a vehicle for cultural transmission. Yes. And because it is a vehicle, you know, for culture, culture meaning uh, social, uh, meaning artistic, religious, you know, metaphysical, and all aspects, including science and technology. Now, the moment you, the moment is a, a, I mean, a language dominates a people, it means that directly or indirectly, the people who are dominated are going to be subjugated in terms of their own cultural 
uh, foundations. Yes, they are going yes. to have to embrace yes. the new, you know, the, the, the totality of the package that goes with the language that they now speak. And then it manifests in various ways in relationships now. You know, a society where you used to have respect for people. It's not just uh, elders that need respect. Children must be yes, respected. Yes, yes. Women must be respected. Disabled persons, uh, you know, must be respected. And, and, so the, and the language but the takes language, care of, in terms of the Yoruba, the African language, is take care of that. But in yes. English, that's a whole different culture. That We don't have that variation. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in English, what we then find is a kind of artificial and intellectualist a kind of thing where we now begin, you know, declarations of human rights as if human rights is something you can declare to make it effective, <laughs> yes. as if it is something you have yes. to teach for people to accept yes. it. It's, it's something that you grow up with, the respect for other people. Yeah. All right, we, we, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you see what's hap- happening, Professor, is that we haven't touched uh, CBAC yet, <laughs> and we're going to get there. Uh, we're just doing two things. We have an hour. And we are almost through with the hour. But let me let me um, go to a quick break and come back. Three minutes now after eight o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum, running Africa, and my very, very special guests in the studio, Mary uh, Bolakojo uh, Biwaji, who is a regional director, Region 1, Jamaica Library Service. She's not representing the Library Service today, but uh, talking to us about uh, language and culture. And of course, Professor Tunde Biwaji, a professor in philosophy, and also a uh, fellow um, at... Uh, I'm trying to find where your fellow again at um, Professor Biwaji at um, is um, Malefi Ketia Sante Afrocentric in, uh, Center mm-hmm. uh, in at uh, you know in Philadelphia. Okay, yeah. all right, and uh, well known here in Jamaica, the University of the West Indies, of course, one of the uh, chief organizers of the. See back colloquium 2014. All right, we're going to just jump from the uh, discussion on language and culture and to go quickly to uh, see back because so the, the, the colloquium uh, took place in April yes. and had uh, certain objectives. Uh, Pan African colloquium. Can you remind us of what the objectives were, first of all. Uh, um, the objectives, as, um, as stated, you know, in the communique. Uh, was first and foremost to uh, to create the desirable space and forum for experts, students, researchers, you know, and everybody connected with African uh, knowledge systems to come together mm-hmm. so that they can present their work, discuss those ideas, and see, you know, how much or what can be adapted and utilize for contemporary development also to help us to see the place of anthropology, archaeology, history, and philosophy in the identity politics of Africa, and especially in helping us to use that, you know, for development. Uh, Some people would say that, uh, you know, all those things are rather... You know, they are not really important. Mm-hmm. You know, what drives the world today is science and technology mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know your ancestry, uh, then you will not be able to know whether there was technology in your ancestry exactly. and you are, how you are going to use that yes. to, 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 to move forward, uh, to expand the fr- frontiers of uh, pan Africanism which was very critical. And then the conference itself was specifically to foster the the stock taking and the improved uh, investigation and dissemination of knowledge in general with regard to Africa and the diaspora. Remember that uh, the African Union has now declared that the diaspora is the sixth region. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first five regions are north, east, west, central, and south, and the sixth region is the diaspora. But there is so much uh, what you can call a gap, knowledge gap between the diaspora and continental Africa. So the conf- the colloquium was one of those uh, instruments, you know, for bridging that gap, yes. and that that will lead us to some of the 
uh, recommendations, you know, from the from the colloquium. Right, and we want to get um, uh, to those so that we can spend a little time yeah. uh, uh, on looking at what came out of the colloquium. Yeah. So, uh, quite a few recommendations coming out there. Twelve or so. Yes, uh, probably about, more. About, yeah, but yes. a little bit more. Yes, yes. All right. But so the central, <laughs> the central thing there is uh, first and foremost to recognize that the indigenous communities of Africa and the diaspora, we are not what you can call uh, epistemological, you know, empties. You know, you know the old thing about the empty baggage syndrome uh, cannot hold. Right. And that the first thing that needs to be done is to bring African scholars, public intellectuals, first to deconstruct the Eurocentric dependencies you know, I mean, currently Jamaica is in the throes of IMF, mm -hmm. and they keep telling us that Jamaica is developing and that everything is now about to take off. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. same thing that we heard in the 90s, exactly. we are now hearing now. And the but then the, the, the dependency still continues. So right. the colloquium was engineered toward ensuring that we do an introspective understanding of what it means for development and all that. And then secondly, to encourage the diaspora to visit Africa. You know, people in the diaspora who may want to visit Africa and people in Africa who may want to visit their brethren and sisters in the diaspora and to create a path, you know, that we have a database by which we can collate such interests and match them mm -hmm. so that people can be received in Africa and Africans coming also can be received. And what's interesting, um, Professor, is that, uh, so I hear, you know, the first recommendation, and I think, wow, um, Amos Wilson um, said that very well um, over, over, you know, over many, many moons. And then here we are now talking about visiting Africa, and I'm saying, and, and so many other persons, you know, but Marcus Garvey, Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey, yeah. so that even uh, a lot of the prescriptions and um, a lot of the the advice given by uh, some of the, the greatest Pan-Africanists like Molimu Marcus Masai Gavi and so we find ourselves at the same place and it's not even a crossroads. It's yes, because we have not actually moved effectively on them. Mm. Uh, we have not moved effecti effectively on them. I mean, if you look at most Jamaicans, for example, most people either want to go to Europe or America or Canada you know, we are not even exploring our own community in the CARICOM effectively enough. Mm -hmm. Nor do we look to Latin America. I mean, somebody was saying, um, you know, that Colombia, for example, that you don't, you know, that you don't really, when you go to Bogota, you hardly see blacks, you know, as such. Mm -hmm. You know, but and, then and when, you look at the, when you look at the Colombian team, football team, yes, yes you will see that there are blacks. I there, got those so. calls. People are saying, <laughs> so much black people here in Colombia. Yes. Yeah, you don't have, but it's a similar thing with Egypt, isn't it? Yes, it's yes, like you yes, go yes, to Cairo yes. and you don't see black people, but yes. then as soon as you move out of Cairo, Aswan yes. and, and so on, I mean. So there, there yeah. is that, there is yeah. that uh, discontinuity. You know, there is that uh, absence. So we are. So we are, we are full. We are also at this time um, observing and celebrating 100 years of Garvey's in 100 years, July 20, yeah. since the formation of the UNIA. And what that tells me is that we are 100 years behind if we have not acted up on a lot of these uh, the recommendations. recommendations. That uh, and uh, incidentally, you know, um, there is recognition that some of these things that the, the you know institutional structures need to be built okay to facilitate these things and those institu institutional structures can be built in ways you know from very modest beginnings mm -hmm. but once you get the goals defined properly then it becomes easy to move forward with them and i believe that the fact that you hosted that colloquium itself is signal and the, the contribution of of the principal's office, the campus principal's office, you know, shows that there is a thinking that appreciates and recognizes the leadership position that the University of the West Indies can can play. We're Just like uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, you know, the role that the intellectuals in the Caribbean played in the liberation of Africa from colonialism. You know, you now find that the University of the West Indies is also being called upon 
okay, to liberate itself from its Eurocentric underpinnings and begin to a new understanding of the fact that the Caribbean is populated by Africans mm. significantly. Yes. We are not saying that you should, you know, uh, forget about the other, the diverse uh, groupings there, but there is a need to coordinate in a structured manner the proper understanding and dissemination and sharing of knowledge mm -hmm. so that the resources can belong to the people, the intellectual property rights can belong to the people and they can be used effectively. You know. so, so does that take us to, because we have been talking in this space, and I know that is something that you've been working on, um, the, we see a Confucius Center at the University of the West Indies, and you, we're, we're talking about Mualimu Mar Marcus Mazaya Garvey, and one of the things we've been saying here, and what you have been um, way ahead on, is why not a Marcus Garvey Center, why not an African Center at the University of the West Indies? What is holding this back, and why, why is this not happening? Well, we... You know, I, I always try to remind people that um, your basis, that is, if the leaf has stayed too long with the soap, you know, it also begins to become the soap. But that, you know, that tendency depends on whether there is assimilation on both sides. Uh, I've always been very conscious of the fact that I'm still a migrant, even if I've spent decades here. Consequently, without the JCKC connection, there are certain things that are difficult to, to penetrate and make happen, regardless of how much you wish it to happen, regardless of the fact that it might be the right thing to happen. But I find that, you know, I've always been very fortunate to have very receptive, uh, you know, people who understand what one is trying to do yes. and who want to cooperate even with the limited capacities that they themselves may have. And consequently, the, the idea of the institute or center that you are talking about, I believe, you know, there is a recognition that there is the need for that to take place currently, you know, uh, on the campus. Mm -hmm. And the... the the logistics of making it happen is mostly finan financial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe that if there is a will, we can always put our heads together to see how to make it happen financially. And I believe we are getting to that point where we cannot ignore it for forever. And uh, the CBAC, for example, CBAC is supposed to be a pan-African uh, organization we also have Codestria, you know, mm -hmm. in Senegal. We have other uh, institutes in South Africa, in East Africa, and all that. But we don't have the kind of overarching uh, center that we are talking about in terms of maybe a Marcos Garvey center. Mm -hmm. You know, we will, I don't know if we do have a foundation or an endowment kind of thing named after Marcos Garvey. If we have that kind of resource base, Okay, it can then partner with institutions like UWE that might be interested in doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there will be many people of goodwill globally who will be willing, you know, to put their resources in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is to first of all move to the point where it is recognized that this is needed and this has to be done. Once you get to that point, then making it happen then becomes a challenge, which you then call everybody and say, yeah, you know, you have to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. And I do Liberty Hall itself could be, could be one of the drivers uh, in, that, in that situation, I think. Pardon? Liberty Hall. Yes. Um, it could be, could be one of the drivers there. But I think it's something that, um, as you said, there's this recognize that that is needed. And yeah. we need to talk a little bit more about it. But let me just take a quick break and come right back. Better looking homes and gardens start with Rapid True Value. Visit any location island wide for a wide range of paints, tires, lighting, tools, appliances, hardware and building supplies. You're sure to find what you need. Rapid True Value, everything you need to build, renovate, decorate. The time by Rapid True Value is 16 minutes now after 8 o'clock. Jamaica's senior national women footballers are back on the road for the first time in six years. The reggae girls will compete in Group 5 of the CFU playoffs in the Dominican Republic, June 16 to 23, as they start their quest for a spot in the 2015 FIFA World Cup Finals in Canada. 
Cross Sport and Choice Sai FM will be in the Dominican Republic covering the team on and off the field of play with live and recorded reports. It comes to you courtesy of Contractors Music Marketing, promoters of Morgan Heritage's new single, Put It On Me. Massive used auto parts for the best parts, best deals, and best prices. Call us now at 974 5639 Island Eyewear. Come to Island Eyewear. Complete eyeglasses only 3900 Bounce out party and furniture store. Turtle River Plaza. Ultraries for all your household and party needs. Total tools, rentals, and repairs. Now open in Kingston at 34 Slime Road or 9080667. This Spa, 8 Rivers Plaza, Ultraries. Rejuvenate your mind and body. Auto All Car Rental Limited, White River, Ultraries. Three Dumpers. Road Kingston and Six Lenya Road May Penn. Call 986 6930. And Mr. T. Auto Parts Main Street Auto Rears now offering massive discounts on headlamps. <laughs> You think you know football? You have a world of knowledge? Enter the Lime World of Winnings football promotion and play your way to big prizes. Answer football questions daily and get 100 points for each correct answer. The player with the highest point at the end of the competition wins $500,000. Second highest, $250,000. You could also win weekly and daily prizes of TVs, smartphones, cash, or mobile credit. Just text Brazil at 444-4625 to enter the Lime World of Winnings. Promotion runs from June 2 to July 13, 2014. See the press or Lime.com for details. Lime, value every moment. Asthma is a serious disease that affects young and old. It causes the airways in your lungs to get swollen, and you may have difficulty breathing. To help prevent asthma, you should avoid stress, smoke, and temperature changes. Asthma is one of the chronic illnesses covered by the NHF, saving you money on your prescriptions. The National Health Fund wants you to be fit and healthy and reminds you that your health is your responsibility. Listen up, dollars, pick two, pick three, pick four, cash part, early bird draws up next, coming at uh, 8.30. You're inside of the Africa Forum, running African Professor Tunde Biwaji and Mrs. Uh, Mary Biwaji in the house, and we're talking about African languages, but we're also talking about uh, the CBAC uh, colloquium that went at the University of the West Indies, but African Conference, uh, April and uh, looking at the recommendations coming out of that. All right, uh, Professor, let's go through the other recommendations because um, that came out of the conference itself. Um, yeah. Be- before we go to the CBAC, yes, the uh, Marcos Gave thinkings and uh, ideas, education system is embracing it now. And Jamaica Library Service had already set up a large collection at the St. Anne Parish Library. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, yes, uh, yes and it's yes. a large one. It was even launched and many people, some children got some scholarships yes. when it was being launched. Of course, yes, so, I was there. Ma- Our main concern with that, and I think it's brilliant work that is being done and good work being done by uh, Amina Blackwood Meeks also in getting it in the schools. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is the extent to which the information is uh, available to the students because we understand that the center of stairs of a library is not uh, accessible, is that it's locked off uh, and persons can't just access the information like that, which is one of the concerns that we've been. You can look into it and I'll, I'll I'll check that out. Yes, please, sure because we've, that. we've heard a lot about that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so, so, so that, uh, and, and one of the reasons why Mrs. Biwaji mentioned that is that we've been talking about the. A, 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 a center at the a tertiary institution, whether it's UE, whether it's NCU, wherever, but, but of course with, we, we have been saying the University of the West Indies, um, which is a Molemu Marcus Messiah Garvey Center, but in essence, which is an African center um, that we don't see on the ground here in Jamaica, uh, goes beyond and, 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 and outside as, as broad as possible uh, to include um, Pan Africanism, African teachings, African languages, and so on. Um, African philosophy uh, and, and, and much more. And when I say African, I mean we ourselves, you know. Well, the, 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 in that regard, part of the recommendation of the colloquium is that it is now time to bring the universities, the colleges together, mm-hmm. especially the historically black colleges in the U.S., the various institutions across the globe where resources are, are stored or where researches are taking place into various aspects of African 
culture, African life, African civilization. Yes. So that when you bring that together and you remove it from the elitism, which prevents the dissemination of the knowledge, and then you bring, you know, if you have a center devoted to research where you have PhD students coming in, postdoctoral uh, students coming for research, uh, researchers into science, into medicine, into technology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of them, mm -hmm. you know, using the indigenous knowledge systems. You know that currently there is so much taking place in the herbal, you know, the, the herbs, in terms yes. of plant uh, uh, research. I see the work that, that Dr. Lowe and, and, uh, and others are doing. Yes, yes, and our indigenous people knew the various uses of the herbs. It is now the responsibility of our universities and colleges and technological centers to begin researching, extracting the, the potent components of these herbs so that we can begin to use them to treat the various ailments in a biotechnological manner mm -hmm. where the residue, I mean, they prescribe a drug for you and they say that when you take this drug, one of the consequences is that you might die or you might have a cardiac, you know, arrest. Yes. And I say, oh, so how is this drug going to be useful to your body mm -hmm. if it can cause you to die? And sometimes when you, when, you, when you look at how indigenous knowledge systems have treated with all these things, yes. they know that whatever you get from natural plants can go into your system and it can come out because it will be digested. It will not leave a residue that is going to cause mm -hmm. other complications in your system. All right, uh, look, Professor Bewaji, I'm going to rush you a little because we yeah. have just seven minutes left. Oh, okay. And so what I want to do is, is for you to go through the, the recommendations um, as, 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 well, as you choose because I, I don't know if you're going to select all. Yes, but I think we have, we have been, enough time to, to go through. We have been going through them, yes, you yes. know, but the critical component, let, let me read it. A few of them right uh, to create partnerships with historical black colleges and universities that can become sister universities with African universities to create a comprehensive needs assessment which is adaptable to each country's needs to evaluate the role of education and the curriculum to tie it into the findings of the needs assessment and to develop international relationships between CARICOM, African Union, and the Americas mm -hmm. to develop youth entrepreneurial programs to begin to create future business people for Africa and the diaspora and then to broaden trade opportunities between Africa and the diaspora and to create administrative structures on solid intellectual and academic traditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, those are the last, you know, eight or so of those uh, recommendations. Yes. But the critical thing about it is that the idea is we need to begin to build institutional structures now that can help to coordinate some of these things. You know what? that uh, Nigeria was just declared the largest economy, you know, yes, by some yes. statistical yes. fiat. Mm -hmm. But when you go anywhere, you don't see products from Nigeria on the shelves. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the kind of trading and all those things does not take place. South Africa, you know, you, you can see some of the products of South Africa on Jamaican supermarkets simply because there is that kind of thing. So there is need to begin to collaborate. Well, that's a remnant of apartheid. And you see, and we have to call a spade a spade. A lot of the things we get, wines and so on from, from South Africa are coming through European uh, or white South African companies. Oh, really? uh, yeah, sometimes we have to just call a spade a spade. But So there is no trade uh, among uh, continental Africa in, to the extent that we need to see trade. No. And then that kind of exchange we're not seeing between Africa and the diaspora either. Yes, so and and recently, recently, that? you see, recently there was an agreement, a memorandum that was signed on air linkage, and initially, the my understanding is that it was uh, Barbados was supposed to have been the hog. But I think it's, and I there was that at least was, one. I thought that doesn't make sense. Right. Because the entire population of Barbados can hardly feel how many planes. Well, I know, means, I, I know my brother Mutabaruka is listening and you're, you're touching exactly on the point that he's been talking about. But yes. go on, go on, yes. Whereas, if Jamaica is the hub, 
then you can find people coming from all over, from Central America, from, you know, South America, from, you know, even the U.S. So we have because to from, from Kingston to Lagos or to Dakar will be less than six hours. Yes. Okay? Yes. And that then opens up cargo, you know, cargo transportation and all those things, which will then expand the trade. But also, the consciousness needs to be to be uh, to be to be changed. I think that there is a critical mass, as as Jerry um, would say, uh, yeah. Bongo Jerry, that is thinking in the exact same way that you are thinking. Because ju I just sat down with Muta and heard him say exactly what you just said there yeah. um, last week. So that I think that um, these are the minds. We are the minds. You know, we're the ones that we've been looking for. Um, we really need to come together to to to, to lobby for that change because yeah. that's how change happens it happens when the people uh may get up and 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 and, and act because we're not going to see it necessarily from governments but we can push government lobby government to make these changes but we have to do it together and I we also that's need to encourage we also need to encourage uh investment cross-border investment because, you know, if you look at the investment in Jamaica, you find that the resources that are invested, the, the, the capital is working and making money for, for, the, for the people who invest. But if, if, for example, Jamaicans invest in Nigeria, Nigeria being the most populous uh, country in, in Africa, you have that market. And if you have that market, and then you also invest in Jamaica, that gives you the opportunity for the development that we are talking about. It does, and and I think the the CBAC conference was a good, uh, you know, stepping stone to to push all of these recommendations. We'll continue to talk to them, talk about them, uh, Professor Biwaji, yeah. uh, Mrs. Biwaji. Going to give yes. you thirty seconds just just to wrap up, just to say some quick final words. Thirty seconds. Okay. okay. Um, let us look at the language again. The Yoruba language is very rich and the culture is very rich. When we think of ourselves as being connected to Africa, we have to embrace the people of Africa. When we are looking at Africa through European culture and Africa, uh, American culture, we are making a big mistake. We are going to leave it there yes. and we are going to invite you back oh. with or without Professor Biwaji because <laughs> we need to have this conversation in this space. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thank thank, thank you, so. you very much, uh, Mrs. Biwaji. Thank you. All right. Thank Thank you very much. We can't say how much we, we appreciate you coming in and doing this uh, with us. Uh, we're standing by now for the Supreme Venture Super Lotter Draw. Listen up, dollars, pick two, pick three, pick four, cash bot, early bird draws are uh, coming up next right here on, on IRFM. Time on IRFM, uh, 8.30 and now time for the draws. All right. Uh, congratulations to all of today's winners. Tune in later at 10.30 a.m., for another uh, chance to win in dollars, pick two, pick three, pick four, and cash pot draws. You're inside of the Africa Forum, running African on IREFM. 834, Kanaka, Brasilia is up next. Time now, 835, and time for Kanaka, Brasilia. Roger Hasfall is standing by on the phone lines. Roger, good morning. It is over to you, sir. I know that you also have with you a direct link to Ghana, and we've got a Ghanaian link in the studio, and Professor Tunde Biwaji hopefully will uh, be staying with us uh, through Kenaka. But it's over to you, Roger Hasfall. Hi, good morning to you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. And, uh, well, what a work we have been having so far. In terms of the African teams, though, they have gone at 8 points out of the 28 points that would have been available for them following the completion of the 9 matches that have been played. 2 wins and a drawn and 2 drawn results plus 5 losses from 9 games indicate that the African teams have gotten off to the worst possible start of the tournament and is playing catch up with their counterparts from different continents. As far as they're seeing, Nigeria unbeaten after 2 games including a win and a draw is the best African team on show so far. They have recorded one win and a loss is the next best, followed by Ghana, one draw from two games. Algeria, one loss from one game. While Cameroon is the most disappointing so far for African teams with two losses from their two games. As far as we see, all five teams are displaying 
up to yesterday, a lack of final third quality in their first set of games, despite a victory by the Ivory Coast over Japan and a draw by Nigeria against Iran. Uh, the Ivory Coast were finally able to break down Japan and went on to win their game after the inclusion of Didier Drogba in the second half. But for long moments, it should have been appearing that despite their dominance of 58% in that game, they wouldn't be able to do so. Ghana had 62% against the United States, dominant, but stack of final third quality affected them before losing, while Nigeria had 70% dominance against Iran, yet it yielded nothing. Algeria, they went ahead against Belgium. They couldn't hold on. They went down 2-1. The Ivory Coast lost an even contested in second encounter with Colombia in their second game, and uh, that has set them back a little. And they were showing some quality, however, in that loss. Um, yesterday, Nigeria and Ghana did their homework from the first game and gave a significantly improved performance against Bosnia Herzegovina and Germany in their second game yesterday. Both teams stepped up their final third quality getting behind the defences with more regularity and showing the ability to unlock with creativity um, the defences. This was a hallmark of both teams yesterday. So, so far, um, the African teams are playing catch-up, but based on what we saw yesterday from both Nigeria and Ghana, they did their homework and are leading the way, leading the fight back as the World Cup progresses, Andrew. All right. Uh, just to let our listeners know that Kanaka Brasilia is brought to you by Tools Rental and Repairs. Now opening Kingston at 34 Slipe Road. Call 908-0667. And Bounce Out Party and Furniture Store, Turtle River Park in, Turtle River Park in Ocho Reyes. On the line uh, from Ghana, Gold FM in Ghana is Prime Eye. Prime Eye, good morning. Is good that, morning, Captain. All right, Prime. I, I'm, I don't know. Are those your dogs? <laughs> or do those dogs belong to? <laughs> are those your dogs in the background, or do they belong to to, to Roger? But but but. <laughs> but they, they are within the neighborhood, actually. Yeah. Okay. But but Prime I, Wow. Lots of dogs. All right. Um, we want to know what the mood is in like Ghana. How are, how are Ghanaians are um, responding to what happened? Um, the draw with Germany, the play uh, by Ghana yesterday, and also Nigeria. How are Ghanaians responding? Yes, it's been uh, well. It's been one of the mixed uh, mixed feeling because. Uh, Ghana, Ghanaians were actually expecting the team to win, but uh, we, we couldn't come up with a win. We had to settle for a draw. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, was, it was such a stunning performance from the Black Stars of Ghana, absolutely no doubt about that. Um, meeting one of the world's best, the team tipped to actually win the World Cup, and we're talking about the German team. They, they're one of the teams tipped to win this World Cup, and the Ghana Black Stars let them go for go and boot for boot. And, I mean, they, they, they really impressed Ghanaians just that we were expecting a win. Uh, at some point in the game, we expected the Black Stars to move ahead and get uh, the three points for us. But, unfortunately, they couldn't. Uh, we just have to settle for the one point in the draw. So, what's the, yeah. mood, what's the mood like? So it's one of the mixed feelings, really. Yes. So, so, are people celebrating or are they just, you know, waiting with bated breath to see how this unfolds? It was waiting with, waiting with bated breath uh, because uh, we have another match on Thursday with uh, Portugal, and that is the decider. That would actually be the decider. We'd have to win that match to be able to get our three points, yes. and then add that to the one point we had uh, uh, from yesterday's uh, yesterday's match. So, I mean, yes, it's one of cautious optimism, I would say, because we are not that impressed with what we did. Uh, with the USA, even though we played very well, we uh, we couldn't get the essential thing, which was the goal. Well, we're, and, we're and and the, the US actually won against Ghana. Uh, but we're we're waiting for that particular game because we have to win that game to be able to qualify for the next stage. We are very uh, for the next stage of the competition. I am very optimistic. All right, um, in the studio we have uh, Mr. Denard Kluve, who is <laughs> who is a former national player for Ghana, 1995 to 1999. He played for Ghana and uh, now principal of a Tom yes. Christian Academy here in Jamaica and also coach of Saint Anne Major League Team Nana FC. Mr. Kluve, um, your response to what you saw with Ghana uh, yesterday? 
Well, uh, actually, uh, yesterday match was <coughs> very uh, determined for us. So that's why we went out to make sure that we, we win the match. Uh, yesterday, the only mistakes that I saw was we are not scoring. That is the only mistake. And selfishness make us to lose that match. Yes, I saw that selfishness. Selfishness make yeah. us to lose that match. So I just pray that they go back. But you didn't lose a match, did you? I lose it. Uh-huh. It's a lose. It's two, two, to me, it's a lose. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Because I want to win that match. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if, yeah, you should have won that. Yeah. You should have won that. We should have won. No, but it's a draw. Goodness, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We also have <laughs> <laughs> Professor, um, uh, Roger, Professor Tundevi Waji from Nigeria, who is an avid football fan. Is still, yeah. is still here in the studio. Um, You want to throw, shoot a question at him? Well, the, okay. the, you see, one thing I always wondered about Ghana is why you have one of the best midfielders on your bench. Uh, you know, yes, yes. Why do you keep, uh, you know, why do they... Well, actually, the reason why the reason why they didn't use Essien is because of his injury. Oh, okay. Because, you know, he's, he's one of the very best yes, in the world yes, yes. in terms of understanding game, yes. in terms of distribution. You know, he's the same caliber with uh, someone Mutaro. like, uh, Mutaro. you know, Mutaro. yes, like, uh, yeah, Mutaro yeah. or, or but Mike. But isn't, isn't, isn't he out of the Portugal game now, Roger? Yes, it's not, because no, he's, he's not playing against Portugal because he got he's two got yellow cards. Yellow card. oh. Well, so in in you see the the play was very good, and it showed a kind of understanding of what was happening on the field. Yeah. But in the final, third. you know, third, yeah. where there is need for proper distribution so that it can be finished, like what Emenike played, which led to the Nigerian goal. Yeah. If you didn't have somebody with that Experience. kind of vision, yeah. you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get it to happen. That's yeah. that's the problem. We're gonna throw it back to you, Roger. So to, 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 indeed, for, for, indeed. Yes, you know, that, that's, that's a loss. The, yes. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was saying. Uh, the both teams yesterday they they did their homework from the first game because the both teams they dominated um, their opening games. USA, as I said, they had Ghana had sixty two percent dominance yet lost, and uh, Nigeria had seventy percent percent dominance and lost again and draw against Iran. But yesterday, um, we, we saw better final third creativity and uh, the ability to unlock. And uh, I, I guess that based on what happened yesterday, um, they, the both teams, Ivory Coast, of course, they are still in with a chance. The only team without a chance right now is Cameroon. But right, they will be doing better based on what I saw yesterday. All right, we've got, we got to wrap it there. Um, I, I co-hosted with you this morning, Roger. Can I come yes. here? Thank you very much for allowing me to do so. Prime I Not Ghana, problem. thank you very much. We're watching Ghana. We have our fingers on it. We know that Ghana is going to win the next game against Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prime I at Gold FM. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kluve. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bawaji, by standing by and, and helping us uh, through this one. Thank you very much also, Roger. You're welcome. All right, Kanaka Brasilia brought to you by Tools Rental and Repairs. No open in Kingston at 34 Slide Road. Call 908-0667 and bounce out party and furniture store. Total River Park in Ocho 846, just a minute late with the news. We apologize for that. Natalie Campbell is standing by with the local and international headlines. Coming up right now. Good morning, I am Natalie Campbell with the local and international headlines. The search continues for a toddler who disappeared from her home in Grove Farm, Old Harbor, St. Catherine. Three-year-old Samania Blumfield has not been seen since Friday evening. Police have activated a high alert for her. She is of brown complexion, slim build, and is about 91 centimeters or three feet tall. Reports from the Old Harbor Police are that Samania was discovered missing from her bed by her mother about midnight Friday, June 20. Samania was wearing a pair of cream underwear and a purple blouse. Police say all efforts to find the three-year-old girl have proven futile. Anyone with information about little Samania Bloomfield is being asked to contact the Old Harbor Police at 983-2255, Police 119 emergency number or the nearest police station. 
The National Water Commission, NWC, has sought to assure customers in rural Sindandro that the commodity being delivered to them is of the highest standard. This follows media reports that authorities had discovered high levels of bacteria in the water supplied to communities in that area by the NWC. However, the NWC says it harnesses and treats water from more than 40 small water sources in rural St. Andrew and collects hundreds of water samples every month for testing at its lab to ensure the water delivered to all consumers meets the highest standards of quality and safety. The Commission says this is in addition to tests conducted by the local public health and regulatory authorities. It adds that the public should be assured that while some systems in rural St. Andrew did not at all times during April this year meet all quality standards, negative readings for chlorine do not necessarily mean that the water is not safe. Detectives attached to the Organized Crime and Investigation Division, OSID, have listed three men as persons of interest. They are David Stewart, otherwise called Deco and Cooley, Akeem Tomlinson, otherwise called Peebo, and Linville Forrester, otherwise called Buster. Police say it is believed that the men can assist with an investigation and attempts to make contact with them have proven futile. The men are also being asked to report to OSID in Kingston or the nearest police station by 6 p.m. tomorrow, Monday, June 23. Anyone knowing their whereabouts is being asked to contact OSID at 922-3771, police 119 emergency number or the nearest police station. In news overseas, China and Greece have signed business deals worth about five billion U.S. dollars during Chinese Premier Li Keqiang's visit. These signed covered areas including exports and shipbuilding. China also showed an interest in buying railways and building an airport in Crete. China is eager to take a majority stake in the pair of sport. A Chinese company already runs two pairs at the port. Greece is keen to attract foreign investment to reduce its national debt and high unemployment rate. Finally, Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff has been officially endorsed by the governing Workers' Party to run for re-election in October. Speaking to party delegates in Brasilia, Ms. Rousseff promised to boost social policies that have lifted millions of people out of poverty. The party has been in power since 2003. Ms. Rousseff, Brazil's first woman president, is a former left-wing rebel who fought against military rule in the 1960s and 70s. Those were the local and international headlines. I am now. Natalie Campbell. That was news from Irie FM, Jamaica's non aligned news voice. Good morning, Mr. Williams. Very good morning. Sir. Right, you see, I pause because, you know, you're leading this part of the orchestra and I didn't quite know what to do. But um, I realize that That's unlikely. I have, yes, because I know there's a report coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure where the report is slotted by you. Okay. Because I know you take charge of my program from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and decide to slot anything you want to slot in. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, ju- I cannot pause, I, just watching to see where you direct me to go. I will. I yes. will not even try to defend myself. No, don't try. No, no, <laughs> don't even do like the uh, like the who play yesterday. The um, who play against Nigeria again? Bosnia. Yeah, don't even do like those Bosnians. <laughs> not even try to defend yourself. <laughs> do you think that that was a foul? Do you think something happened on No, I don't think it was a fall. I, I, but I thought um, Nigeria was very fortunate yes. not to have gone down one day because it was a goal that Bosnia scored. Yes. Mm, that was disallowed. The referee, that, that referee is certainly going home. Yes, I think so. <laughs> it, I, was, <laughs> yeah. it was yeah. unbelievable deci- the decision that he made, but yeah. it happens. Yeah. So I'm yeah, sure well, he's, you know, he's not getting another game in this world. Yeah, remember what happened to Ghana in South Africa. <laughs> I mean, they, they, can, they can bear it. It happens. It happens. But it's it's still haven't gotten over what happened to Ghana. Unfortunately, but it happens. And, um, mm, it happens. But um, that was a clear goal, yeah. though. So, so, so Africa, you know, I felt kind of good about it. Well, about the teams yesterday. Well, I was most, I was most disappointed with Ghana because, no, Germany is the team that I'm expecting to be in the final. Right. With Argentina. Yeah, those are your two teams. You can no, just no, say. No, no, no. Argentina is my, no, no, one team, Argentina. But I'm expecting, but okay. it's not one team one in the team. tournament. Exactly. Right. So, <laughs> so be, to win the title, you have to beat Argentina somebody in the to final. Win, right, and to the so final. So I am expecting them to beat Germany in the yes, final. Yes, yes, But when I saw the odds that Ghana was offering yesterday, <laughs> yes. I just couldn't resist. What, what couldn't you resist? They were going at $10. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 
I had n- I had no sympathies for Germany at all yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. I wanted Ghana to win. That you should yes. see me jumping when they went to one. Oh goodness! You know I missed that equalizer <laughs> from Germany because I just stepped away thinking that when it's over now it's done. But my problem I is that um, when Ghana went ahead, I figured it was a little too early. Mm. You know? Ah, oh, yes, yeah. because that is the. That's how we see but, things unfolding. Yeah, because I know Germany is a good team, you know. Right, see, but you want to set the thing first. You want yeah. to at least clear the path. Yeah, so it, yeah. if that score, that, that, that go-ahead goal, say yeah. about 80 minutes, I know yeah. I yeah. would be smiling. Yes, yes. I found <laughs> the last... Laughing, really. I found the last... You, you, because you, 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 you cashed in yeah. or you cashed out? I, could, I, can't, I, <laughs> I <will. laughs> cashed out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look here now. <laughs> the last, the last, about four or five minutes, four minutes at least mm-hmm. of the Nigeria match. I really, I watched it with my eyes closed. <laughs> I am not lying. I was so tense. I couldn't believe it. I just kept saying to myself, "Me not watch it. Me mm. not look at it. Me not watching it." <laughs> but thank God. I mean, we like what happened. I had to leave before the match ended. So yeah. the first thing I came back, I said, "How it end? One, mm. one day. So yes, yeah. okay. Looks good. So they still have a chance of going to. Yeah. But they have a big team to face. Yes. Next match, a um, big team. Who them facing? Who them facing? I, I no. think it's Argentina. <laughs> 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 They're facing your team. <laughs> oh well, well you know. <laughs> but I'm expecting them to make it to the next round. Yeah, the Super Eagles aren't really afraid of anything. Well, I doubt they would be. Yeah, as we but saw. I'm, that, I'm expecting yeah. them to join Argentina. Yes. But, but the good thing about that game yes. is that Argentina is already ro- through to the round of 16. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they might just be experiment because they're still working out some yeah. some 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 yeah. stuff. Argentina so, need to just relax and be themselves, and you know. Well, we've not like, they've not played. A good game so far. So you said the moment this be it. But I, I doubt this one will be it. So oh. they will probably tri- experiment yeah, with this for one. The, for the next one. So yeah. that might leave and o- make it easier for Nigeria. Yes, and and as Miss as, as Miss Simon Brethren come in here now from um, the Formula One posse. Oh, yes, <laughs> Nick and, and yeah, it was. I know him on a different. <laughs> I, I know him on a different thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, Nick Ra- is um, yeah. Mercedes one two I think. Is it Mercedes. Um, Williams. Williams one two. Williams one two. Nico yes. Rosberg one, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, Hamilton about nine, right? No, he he started at nine. Started at nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hold on, the race finished? Yes, not too long ago. We never know that. Yeah. Just so finished. how much? How much? Um, Hamilton come second. Oh, how much? Rosberg come. Rosberg one. Oh, that's where it's a Mercedes one two. Right. Oh. Because I'm sure that's what I saw when I was coming. Yes, out. I thought you meant the qualifying. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so that's why you're here, Nick. <laughs> Nicholas Francis. So come here, Nick. So, how it went? Hmm? Ferrari. You for how much Ferrari come in? I don't think Vettel finished the race, you know. I don't know. You see my DJ Wayne just back in just mm. you know, this Ferrari thing now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me once at the once upon a time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So 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 Rosberg is on Rosberg is one. So he's gone, he's stretched his leader. He, he's, he uh, is he's a he's a championship leader. So yeah, he's this, gone further ahead. Yeah, this not look good for Hamilton at all. <laughs> <laughs> this not look good, but anyway, one I, I, I'll dissect it later. All right. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't. Okay. Well, good news still. All right. So so back to the football now. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who 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 won today? Who's playing today? Uh, I think Belgium plays today. Belgium, Belgium will be playing who now? I think it is Group H. Belgium play Russia okay. in the first match. And right, then so I we can't miss that. We don't have to watch that. No, you okay. can't miss that. Belgium is one of the big teams. You know? No, sir. We don't watch it. Oh, else we have that. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell me what to watch. Algeria plays in the next match. They play okay. the um, Korea. Well, I think I'm going to do some washing today. <laughs> <laughs> All the housework that didn't get done <laughs> will be done today. <laughs> and 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 I think yeah. and the, I think today is the United States Portugal game. If I'm if I have it correct. All right. What about the point standing? In which in which group? In, in the early groups. Yes, yeah, so uh, we'll Google it, man. Come, we know you don't have it in your head. Ah, uh, well. Uh, all right. Let me let me. So let who's Spain is out? Yes, Spain. Australia is out. Is out. Australia is out. Uh, well, uh, let me find it here. Let me, let me, let me. So, who's uh, Spain is out? Yes, Spain Australia is out. Is out. Australia is out. Uh, well, uh, let me find it here. Let me see if I can find it here. 
and we definitely you say Argentina is already through. Yes, five um, teams already through, mm. including Argentina. What about Germany? Germany, not sure, not clear. Right. Yet. They, they will. That will, that will be decided in their final. Holland is through. Yes, they are through. Mm -hmm. Why is this thing not coming up? All right, never mind. If it not come up, but but exciting. I mean, the whole thing is pretty exciting. I'm finding it so, and um, I know that some people say some of the games boring, which you know. I I have not found any game to be boring. No, not really. Not so far, no. at least. Um, and, and I've watched quite a lot of games. Yes. I I think in the first one, I thought the England Italy game was mm -hmm. probably the best game. I thought the Costa Rica. The Costa Rica match on Friday was probably the most tensed one. It was. As a matter of fact, you know, we're going to go to South Africa uh, in a little while, and the gentleman we're talking to is actually uh, from the Cameroon. So we want to ask him a little bit about that Cameroon in discipline. <laughs> Jesus. Well, well, you know, and it is, and it is, it is, it is manifesting. In the in the in the results of the years, goodness gracious, man, come on! Yeah, because um, yeah. whenever when you whenever you have the, that kind of problem, you know, it is going to come out somehow. Yes, and that is what is happening with the Cameroon team now. So, what time is our report from Dominica? I think it's nine o'clock. Okay, so it's now two minutes after nine. <laughs> 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 Are you the one who's going to introduce it? No, you. Oh, okay. Where do I introduce it from? No, I'll just play it. I'll just do the others of. Okay, so we have a report on Jamaica's Reggae Girls game at the CFU playoffs in the Dominican Republic and uh, Nicholas Evans. The Sporting Choice IRFM now brings you a report on Jamaica's Reggae Girls game at the CFU playoffs in the Dominican Republic. It comes to you courtesy of Contractors Music Marketing, promoters of Morgan Heritage's new single, Put It On Me. Massive use auto parts for your best parts, best deals, and best prices. Call us now at 974-5639. Island Eyewear. Come to Island Eyewear. Complete eyeglasses, only $3,900. Total tools, rentals, and repair now open in Kingston at 34 Slipe Road. Call 908-0667. Mr. T Auto Parts, Main Street, Ocherius, now offering massive discount on headlamps. Bounce Out Party and Furniture Store, Turtle River Plaza, Ocherius, for all your household and party needs. Auto All Car Rental Limited, White River, Ocherius. 3 Dumfries Road, Kingston, and 6 Glenmuir Road, Maypen. Call us at 986-6930. And Nazira Spa, 8 Rivers Plaza, Ocherius. Rejuvenate your mind and body. Nicholas Evans is our reporter on location. Jamaica's Rare Girls are poised to become the seventh qualifiers for the CFU finals of the 2015 FIFA World Cup qualifying tournament. Good morning, I'm Nicholas Evans with this year pregame report. Jamaica versus the Dominican Republic in Group 5 of the CFU playoffs at the Estadio Panamericano in San Cristobal. After scoring 14 unanswered goals in their first international match in six years, blanking St. Lucia 14 nil on Friday, the Reggae Girls are now the firm favorites to claim the lone spot expected to come from Group 5 of the CFU playoffs here in the Dominican Republic. The Jamaicans are down to face the host uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock Jamaica time, 4 p.m. here in the Dom Rep, and from all indications, even the host is expecting a proper flogging from the Jamaicans. For the Jamaicans, this is the first phase of qualifying as as they hope to secure a share of the three and a half spots from the CONCACAF region to the World Cup Finals in Canada next year. Veteran national coach Wendell Downswell, who is assistant head coach Maren Gordon, is expecting more of the same against the Dominican Republic today, but has his concerns for the future as the team gets deeper into competition. Then much we choose choose between them and the the the, the Saint Lucia team, despite the fact that they won seven nil, is just for us now to go out and execute well. You know the things that we have practiced. If we play like how we play in the last five five minutes, I think we will come away with an easy victory. Uh, it, as you know, playing against the host country, and therefore it won't be an easy task playing against them. But once we work out and do the necessary things that we do, we should be able to come away with that, that, that victory. It can be a large margin of victory you know, once we do the things that we do. Because looking at them is not a, a formidable opposition. 
But sometimes what we do is drop our game to their level. So once we can do consistently the good things throughout the game, we should be able to come in with a, a, a good victory. Meanwhile, there will be two changes to the Jamaican starting 11 for the game, with Caden Summon and Mitzi Facey set to replace Jody and McGregor and Yolanda Hamilton, who started in the 14 0 fashion of St. Lucia on Friday. There will also be positional changes in terms of distribution, but the 4 3 3 formation will still be maintained. The full 11 will see Nicole McClure in goal, protected by Captain Alicia Wilson, Sharona Forrester, Mitzi Facey, and Money Price in defense. Nicole Campbell Omalin Davis and Donna Henry will marshal the midfield while Sashana Campbell, Shakira Duncan and Kevin Summon are expected to get the goals. Coach Maran Gordon looks at the task at hand as he explains the changes. Um, the Dominican Republic team is always is a team that is a, is a lively team. Um, they feed off the drum the drums that, that, that their spectator will, will beat in the stand. So as soon as we can get out the drums out of the game, I think we should have it. And so the earlier we get the drums out of the game, it's better for us. The changes. There will be two changes. What is the thought process behind the, the, the changes um, you're about to make? Um, in the first game, we, we did a little um, reshuffling in terms of we, don't, we, we knew that the Dominican Republic was going to watch us, so we did some, some tactical changes. So this is basically our, our, our original starting them that we really wanted to put on the field. And I know these girls are going to go there and execute well. That's coach Meron Gordon. The last time Jamaica entered the senior competition was back in 2008. Elaine Walker-Brown is a long-serving chairperson for women football in Jamaica and she told Larry from sports she's just happy the senior team is back. It's a great feeling and um, one of the things that I, I can say is that the, the attention that these ladies are getting, they have never gotten it before. The support is great and we're hearing the feedback from home and one of the things that I expect to see is great things coming out of the senior program because now they have a support base so we expect that they, with the support that they are getting now they expect to, to do very well That's sheer person of women football in Jamaica, Elaine Walker-Brown this match will definitely qualify the last two teams to the CFU finals in Trinidad in August. The winner of the match will definitely advance, while Puerto Rico would claim the second spot as the best second place team from three team groups. A draw would however see both Jamaica and the Dominican Republic qualifying. That's not a chance Coach Gordon is however willing to take. Well, um, the trickiest result for our coaches is a draw. So um, we're going to approach the game like we need a win. So we're not going to go all, all out and leave. Our, our box open, but at the same time, we're going to play our, our, our attractive football to play the second half in the last game. The Jamaican delegation will start arriving home at midday tomorrow. And if I were a betting man, my money would be on the Reggie girls coming home winners of Group 5. From the Dominican Republic, Nicholas Evans supporting Fire FM Sports. That was a report on Jamaica's Reggae Girls game at the CFU playoffs in the Dominican Republic. All right, 10 after 9, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It's Running African. Thank you very much for joining us on the internet at irfm.net. Thank you very much for making the connection. Also, for those of you who are joining us on your mobile or your iPhone apps, your Android apps, thank you very much. We're on the 107s, 107.1, 107.2, 107.3, 107.4, 107.5, 107.6, 107.7, 107.8, and 107.9. Also, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Kabu, Ma'at Keru, K-A-B-U, Ma'at M-A-A-T, Keru, K-H-E-R-U, Kabu Ma'at Keru, at Kabu Ma'at Keru. On Facebook, Kabu Ma'at Keru Williams. And you can read my blog at Tumblr or at WordPress. Once you find me on Twitter or Facebook, then you'll find me all over the social media, Pinterest and so on. Thank you very much for joining us. Just want to, before we go to South Africa, to talk with Milan Atom about the first conference on Africa land grabs. We want to say thanks to all the little ones who were successful in their GSAT uh, examinations. You got the school of your choice or you got the second or the third school. Hey, congratulations to you and a special congratulations to my own niece, Jada Guy. Hey, Jada. Good morning. Congratulations. You got your first choice. All the best at St. Hilda's High School, my darling. And the average was very, very, very good. We love that. <laughs> okay, Jada, from all of us. 
for your mommy and your daddy, Erica and Howard Guy, and for myself and your grandparents and all your aunties and everybody, congrats uh, on doing very, very well. And I already promised Jada that I am there for the territory side of things. So, and towards the later secondary side in terms of the um, helping with the essays and so on. And I'm certainly there for sixth form. <laughs> all right, well, you know we're there all the time. So, Jada, have a good day today and congrats, my darling. Congratulations. You make us proud. Mwah. And to all, all the young ones, all of you, all of you, you make us very, very proud. And mwah, to all of you, great work. Keep it up and do well at high school now. Don't get distracted. Keep your eyes on the road. Keep your eyes on the ball. Do not be distracted. Lots of distractions at high school, but keep focused, all right? And to the parents, all the parents who are going to be working hard to ensure children get to school for September term. You're already thinking of the uniforms. By the way, talking about uniforms, at the Brownstone High School, am I hearing right that a tie, that one tie at the Brownstone High School costs $1,000? Somebody please tell me if that's right or wrong. Because if that is right, something is wrong. So we understand that one tie at Brownstone High School is costing $1,000. One tie where you put one on your neck, you know, that they, that's going for $1,000. That the student has to pay, a, the parent has to pay $1,000 for that. At other school, ties are like two fifty, three fifty, probably four fifty at the most. $1,000 at Brownstone High. No Brownstone High. If that is true, you got to fix that. Something not right there. Something is wrong. Lots happening as parents get ready to send their children back to school for September. It's not even the summer holidays yet because now they're doing exams. But, uh, you know, already you're thinking of a uniform and the shoes and so on. Don't make it difficult on the school books. Do not make it difficult. Do not. Schools, I beg you, do not make it difficult for parents or any more difficult than it is already. Think of the economy that we're living in. A can't sell one type for $1,000. Not Nagasa. Hey. All right, we want to go to South Africa. You know, a lot has been happening regarding land and ownership of land. The beach situation that we're having in Jamaica ties right back to land ownership. Um, lack of access to the beach has to do with ownership of land. And the way that we treat land and see land in Jamaica, the way the landed gentry <laughs> is still a big part of the Jamaican psyche. And so that poor people are denied uh, part of the poverty is a denial of land. You know, a lot of people who identify themselves as living in poverty, if they owned land, would not necessarily be so, you know. Land is integral, relevant, important to any national development, land ownership. As it is now, we have a serious case of land grabbing going on. Land grab uh, happening across the African continent and the African diaspora. We want to address that. We want to talk about that. The first ever um, Africa land grab conference and the South Africa dialogue is scheduled to take place in South Africa. And there's a dialogue that's going to be taking place in Kenya also. And we're trying to see if there's one that we can arrange for Jamaica. But uh, Africa's problem is our problem in the diaspora. To understand China in Africa, we have to understand China in, uh, in, in, in to understand China in Jamaica, we have to understand China in Africa. I say that even though I'm saying that China is not our only concern when it comes to land grabbing. We have a serious case of land grab happening here in Jamaica, both from the Chinese but also from multinational corporations and private individuals, expatriates, and so on. <laughs> So that Africa's concern is our concern, Africa's problems are our problems, and the African diaspora experiencing the very same, the very same conditions, the very same issues that we find happening on the continent of Africa. It means that the way we deal uh, with the solutions to these problems is going to have to be with uh, the African diaspora, as the African Union has identified as the sixth region of the African Union, that we have to take that seriously, consider ourselves seriously as that, and that our solutions become 
a central solution, the solution on the continent of, of, of Africa, as is here on the ground. So we're going to be going to the phone lines. We're going to South Africa, actually, where my next guest is standing by. Uh, Milan Atom, initiator and team leader of the Africa Conference on Land Grabs. Milan is a Cameroonian who currently resides in South Africa with a humanitarian and development background. He has worked in several countries across the African continent, including DR Congo, South Sudan, Uganda, Swaziland, Cameroon, South Africa and Namibia. He was the UN coordinator for disaster support for the UN in Namibia. And before that, Assessment Coordinator for the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Haiti. After the earthquake, he also spent years in eastern Congo as part of the joint monitoring teams. An experimental outfit of civil military teams tasked, tasked with advisory assistance towards the restoration of government authority in um, hitherto rebel-occupied areas. Currently, uh, Milan is the... Uh, Managing Director of Gravitas Continental Initiative with offices in Namibia and South Africa, focusing particularly on disaster reduction and emergency management assistance to African governments. We go to the phone lines to speak with... We go to the phone lines to speak with Milan. I think we have lost him, though, so that uh, if we could get Milan back on the line. He's also... Uh, he holds a Master's in Public and Development Management and a Master's of Art in Migration Studies from the University of Witwatersrand. And currently, he's a PhD candidate at the Witt School of Governance. We're trying to get him back on the phone line to talk about the first annual Africa Land Grab Conference taking place in South Africa. For the two years, Milan, for the last two years, Milan has been uh, pouring all his energy into creating awareness around the current land grabs on the African continent, and has therefore dedicated some of the resources of Gravitas, which is the company he owns, towards organizing the African Conference on Land Grabs. This, of course, taking place in October in South Africa. He's also a member of the uh, conference steering committee. Uh, the dialogue, as I said before, is going to be on a continental conference on land grabs is scheduled for October in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we're standing by to speak with Milan on that, Milan Atom, who is one of the persons uh, steering this uh, conference. All right, as we go back to the phone lines, uh, Milan Atom, thank you very much, Milan, for joining us from South Africa. Um, thank you so much, Kabu, for having me on the show. All right, we're very, very happy to have met you and to uh, have you in this space, which is a Pan-African space, to talk about an issue that is pertinent, relevant to the continent of Africa, but also to the African diaspora. I want you to give us a, a quick background, Milan, into um, what, what, what the conference is calling uh, the, the conference on land grab. What is land grab and what is the situation currently? How do you define land grab and what is the situation currently? now on the continent of Africa regarding land grabs? Um, thank you very much, Kabu. Um, as uh, the African continent, we are faced with a major, major challenge, which in lots of ways we consider to be the new form of colonization. You may know that um, over 60 million hectares of land um, have, been, have been either purchased or leased to major multinationals across the world purposely to in order to fight against food insecurity and since 2007 2000 since the 2007 2008 crisis this has been going on unfortunately a lot of our governments do not understand the, ec the economics behind this land transactions and uh, if, as a result we think it is necessary for us to be able to sensitize our government to lobby and advocate for better land governance, for the involvement of non-state actors, as well as the directly affected communities to mm -hmm. have a say mm -hmm. in terms of <clears throat> in terms of how their land is being administered. Mm -hmm. All right, um, talk, talk to us about that in terms of how their land is being administered. Uh, what is the impact on the on traditional communities and, and communities generally in terms of how this is now being done? Uh, who are the grabbers? And what's happening to the persons who, you know, traditionally lived on these lands for, for all their lives, ancestors and so on? Well, generally, most of the... We have a lot of... Uh, 
a lot of communities being displaced in order to create farm land. Um, one of the, the, the biggest investment areas is biofuel. And so you will have, for instance, in Madagascar, where approval was given for 2.4 million hectares of land in order to do biofuel, to, uh, to carry out the biofuel project. So communities get displaced, and from a disaster reduction management perspective, we view these kind of transactions in the long term as a potential for, for large-scale disasters. Mm -hmm. So communities get displaced from their land basically means, one, they will, be, they will no longer have access to their traditional way of living. There is enough evidence to prove that commercial farming has never really contributed to stem poverty, mm -hmm. whereas subsistence farming continues to help communities to survive and to live the lifestyle that they have always lived mm -hmm. through the years and through their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So as a continent, we should be looking towards large-scale movement of people from one part of the continent to the other as a result of the displacement, but also one, something that we have experienced over the years is the attempt by Africans to cross over to Europe through the Suez Canal or through the, the Sahara Desert with thousands of them dying as a result. We think, give it another 20, 25 years of population displacement, we will have a lot more um, young Africans trying to cross the desert or trying to cross the, the Straits of Gibraltar and in the process drowning mm -hmm. or ending up in Europe and other countries in the West um, working some of, doing some of the most menial and demanding types of jobs. Mm -hmm. So this is a major problem for us as, as a continent and as a people. So that we see um, uh, migration as, as one of the, the side effects of this, as we see happening now with Africans who are crossing into Israel and are being thrown into detention centers and uh, um, the, the level of discrimination that they face, not just in Israel, but across um, also in Europe. Now, um, who, Europe, yes. Yes, who, are the, who are the grabbers? If we can term it that, who are the people who are acquiring these lands? Are, are they multinational corporations, individuals, uh, governments? Who are they? In fact, Kabu, I think you've touched on basically all of them. It's foreign governments, it's multinationals, as well as powerful individuals. So you have, for instance, um, Saudi-based billionaire um, called uh, Mohammed Al um, Al Moody who has bought vast pieces of land in, uh, across Ethiopia for his own project. And it is, so you, you have either countries which are sponsoring their companies to come onto the African continent to buy land, but you also have individuals who see it as their, as their, uh, their, their prerogative to buy land across the continent. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of our African governments do not understand and realize the long-term implications of these uh, decisions that they are taking. And perhaps I shouldn't forget to mention that water remains a key commodity that these companies and these countries are after. Uh, we have the, the global CEO for Nestle who argued sometime last year that water should not be a free commodity but should in fact be a product that should be owned and controlled by private entities so that community, whoever wants to consume water will have to buy it and pay for it. So in essence, we are looking at a scenario where if their plans go through in the next few years, communities may basically not have access to their own streams and rivers because these streams and rivers have been privatized and they will have to buy, pay and buy the water in order to drink and to do their laundry. This is this is most alarming. We we were aware that this we would get to this point. Uh, we heard Gordon Brown, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of Britain, um, about Britain. Yes. yes, about five or six years ago, maybe more, uh, pointing to the fact that Africa was the next frontier. And right after that, we heard the former Pope um, Benedict and the one before him uh, talked yes. about um, you know asking missionaries to go back to the continent of Africa within the same context that Africa is, in, is the last frontier and, and Christianizing yes. the continent of Africa. Now, now, when we saw all of this happening, um, there were activists and, 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 and watchers and, and critical thinkers who were pointing to uh, the, the, the 
disaster that would follow once they begin to operationalize um, these these theories that they had about the continent of Africa. Land grabbing, I think, is, is one of those that we see now in operation. Uh, in terms of what Africa, has Africa, and I know there are many countries in Africa, but generally speaking, has Africa now yes. changed its, its, its way of de dealing, uh, doing business as far as land is concerned? Because I remember going to Africa in 1992 and um, being told in West Africa, across West Africa, that Yes. Land, uh, we do not sell land, and land, you cannot own land in this area. It belongs traditionally to the people, and it remains with the people. Yes. Uh, and I know that that yes. was replicated across the continent of Africa. Is that changing then? Yes. Well, that is rapidly changing. We, we now have the arrival of the Chinese, for instance. Um, a lot of the countries from um, Southeast Asia who are purchasing large tracts of land. And in the process, there is... A, there is a, a new greed that has surfaced, emerged amongst African leaders and those in positions of decision making. So more and more we start to see a new trend of the individualization of land as opposed to a community approach to land, which is the reason why we now have, for instance, talk about water being privatized, which in essence and according to African culture, water is so sacred that is the one thing you, you should never sell. So I think there is definitely a, a threat to an, an, an erosion of how Africans have always perceived land and the use of land. Mm -hmm. This is definitely happening. And uh, in terms of what is being done and, and the understanding across the continent, th there is little doubt that communities are actually putting up a fierce fight, trying to defend their lands and their way of living. It is The, the unfortunate thing is that we have the, we have the involvement of government officials. In fact, I had a meeting with one of the ambassadors recently who argued that what is happening in his country is in fact not land grabbing, but a commercial transaction between the country and, and the various entities involved, which definitely tells us that while they are looking at the short-term gains, they fail completely to look at the long-term implications. We have been um, there Fortunately... Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, I was going to say fortunately... At the community level and also within civil society, there is, there is an increasing understanding and awareness of what is happening and people are beginning to talk about it. We just feel that it is such an urgent issue that we should not only be talking about it, but now there is need for us to start acting, which yes. is the reason why we feel that we need to have a conference and have a, create a platform where Africans can come together and start talking about these issues. All right, and the conference is going to be in October. Let us talk about that conference yes. now. Um, we we yes. know it's going to be South Africa in, in, in October. Tell us a little bit about uh, who's going to be there, what format it will take, and what it hopes to achieve, the objectives, and so on. Well, um, perhaps the first thing to say is we, as organizers, we try as much as possible to, to acknowledge that foreign direct investment is very important and that whatever we do, the idea is not to chase away investment but rather to, to ensure that there is a responsible investment. So the purpose of the conference is not to go in there with a fixed mindset but rather to create a platform for all the various, the various stakeholders to come and put their case. So one of the first products or outcomes of the conference we hope is to get to gain a better understanding and to create awareness around these land transactions and also for us to be able to define and have a common understanding as to is this in fact land grabs or something else and if it is something else then what is it and how do we tackle it we it will the, the continental conference will will largely be policy and academic driven um, it, so we are planning on having a three-tier approach to this issue. The first being the conference, which will happen in October, um, and it is basically to look at the policies governing land across the continent in various countries, how this has impacted on the various communities, and then we will then move to the second tier, which is to start engaging members of parliament, engaging the different regional bodies, and getting them to understand the implications of, of these transactions. Whereas the third approach would basically be to work at grassroots level with the different communities, with the different traditional leaders to create awareness and get them to understand what is going on. Mm -hmm. um, 
there will be academic papers presented which will largely be um, um, sourced from empirical research that have been done across various countries in Africa. Mm. We are hoping to produce at the end of the conference uh, uh, a book or a booklet with all this fi the findings of this research so that that begins to inform our, our lob the lobby and the advocacy that we will take to African governments but also to the African Union and beyond Africa, um, which of course we need to say we are actually happy to to learn that um, the diaspora Africa is quite interested in this yes. and that uh, I, we think, I personally think, and having discussed with the steering committee, it is important that we start getting the involvement of uh, our diaspora. Of course, yes, and we're very, very happy uh, that, that you're doing this because I think, as I said earlier, Africa's problem is our problem because I hear you talking about continental Africa and I know every person listening uh, uh, across the African diaspora, especially within the Caribbean region, can totally relate no of uh, four or five situations um, just like the ones that you, you're describing so that our problem is the same. The same multinational corporations operating on the continent of Africa are operating in the Caribbean. The same governments, China, etc., operating on the continent are operating in the Caribbean. And that makes our problem this, a, a very, very, the same problem. Uh, so that the, there's also going to be a dialogue. And when is that going to be? Well, the dialogue is taking place next week. Mm -hmm. um, this will basically be a South Africa dialogue which uh, sets the pace and uh, in a sense, it informs. It starts to inform um, the, the 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 conference that will happen in October. So, on the 26th and 27th, we are organising the South Africa Dialogue on Land Grabs. It, it's it's worth mentioning that South Africa has a peculiar history around land, around land dispossession, and the claim or the reclaim to ancestral land. And we feel that as the host nation, but also as an as a country that has experienced land. And as we move forward and look into the future around how we want to handle and tackle issues of land, it is important that we also look back at how at the impact of land dispossession um, and how it can affect the population and the whole country. Mm -hmm. So, um, sort of the dialogue that will be happening next week basically starts to starts it, it creates or starts this whole big discussion around land, um, land dispossession, land reclamation and how land transaction and land governance should be done. Mm -hmm. So it will involve uh, a lot of tra many traditional leaders, communities, as well as academics, where we will have panel discussions just to brainstorm and start to have a, a clearer understanding of what's happening on the, con on the continent as mm -hmm. a whole, but also the, the, the implications on South Africa as a country. All right. And I know that, as you mentioned, um, and as the, the information is out, that Kenya will also be having a dialogue, or they had one before. Um, and, yes. and, that, and, this is, and this is the first annual conference, so that you hope to, uh, to, to move this along. But I also hear that you've said that it's a three-pronged approach, which is to first sit down yes. and, and, and interrogate the situation, then move it to, um, to the, how you lobby government, and then to the grassroots yes. level. Uh, we're watching this closely. Yes. We're right with you, and as you know, we have injected ourselves into what you're doing because I think that we need to be part of this in a very, very serious way. Oh. We'll continue this conversation Thank with you. you. So We'll continue this conversation with you, Milan, and with the team. Uh, we think this is urgent. There's an urgency of now on this issue. Uh, we've been here before. It was human resources that were being sold, and hence the African diaspora. Um, uh, and so we need to fix this before all of Africa is totally displaced. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much, Kabu. Thanks for giving us the time, and we hope to continue I'm updating you and updating you on the progress that we are making. Thank you very much. Brilliant. All right. Milan Atom there from South Africa. Thank you, my brother. Now, we have to be very, very serious about what we're doing when it comes to land. And we must understand that the situation on the continent of Africa with land grabs right now is the very same situation that we are experiencing. We seem to be closing our eyes to it. But part of this is economic terrorism that we talked about last week. The placing of human beings in a situation in which they are without hope, without space 
without adequate defense, without adequate means of escape and survival, or means of overcoming actual or threatening danger. This is an actual and a threatening danger. A menace or oppressive force is the very definition of terror, which has not only a physical but also a mental element. Uh, you see uh, Kwe Kweana, who uh, said those words. Uh, we are paying close attention to the land situation in Jamaica. We are being pushed into a, in, a, in, a, in a state of landlessness, which is driving uh, poverty uh, to a degree that we've never seen it before. Uh, multinational corporations, governments, uh, expatriates, foreign governments, buying up land across the continent of Africa, across the Caribbean, here in Jamaica. And they're doing it for farming purposes and for water. And listen, the farming that they're doing, they're sending back this food to their own countries. The food isn't necessarily staying in the, in, in the countries um, where they're, they're farming. The food is being exported out of these countries, as we see um, the, the plan for Madagascar, as we see happening in Ethiopia. And this is bad. Even while we sit here in Jamaica and in the Caribbean and laugh at Africa and laugh at reparations and laugh at repatriation. And even while we twiddle our thumbs while Africa burn. Talking about we don't come from Africa, we don't belong to Africa, we are not Africans. There are many others who are buying up large swathes of land across the continent of Africa. And they're not Africans, but they're making do. And that is what is happening to the continent of Africa. But if, as you look around you and think you're sitting on a comfortable seat, it really is a hotbed of coal, hot coal that we're sitting on without realizing it. Because our own governments betraying, betraying the people. And this is what we have. Governments who continue to betray us. A betrayal by our leaders are selling the land from under us too. Break and we'll be right back. The sixth annual International Charlestown Maroon Conference kicks off Friday, June 20. Three days of celebration. Come see Dinos in the Asafi Yard on Monday, June 23 from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Tino people, Tino agenda, Tino survival. Tino today, what of tomorrow? On Monday, June 23 from 9 to 3.30 p.m. Speak truth to the people. To identify the enemy is to free the mind. Free the mind of the people. Speak to the mind of the people. Speak truth. You're inside of the Africa Forum, running Africa. Now, our vision, the vision of Africa, the Africa Forum, is reuniting the African family for development. Reuniting the African family for development. That's our vision. Our mission, bearing witness, demanding change. Crafting an African-centered agenda for change and development. Blazing new paths to Africa's rendezvous with destiny. Thank you very much for joining us on the internet. And for those persons who have been sending us uh, Facebook messages and tweets, thank you very much. Uh, Lats Dean uh, says, Our beaches, at Lats Dean 75 says, Our beaches represent our emancipation from all forms of isms. And also, um, let's take to the beach emancipation day for the annual Otorius International Regatta. And uh, Barbara Johnson at Barbary007 uh, says, um, uh, Shame, ruin, let me down. All right. Hope I understand that. And uh, at Isaiah 360, Isaiah 360 says, I think that Ghana would have won South Africa 2010, but Luis Suarez handled it to Spain. <laughs> handed it to Spain. And I think that Ghana, okay, yes. And um, poor finishing is hindering the progress of the African teams thus far. Too much bad decisions in front of goal. Also, uh, and, um, okay, uh, Travis at Sivarton. Uh, on Twitter says, the revolution is not an apple that falls from tree. We the people must make it happen. And Gideon Child 
Get your child on Twitter at David four eight six zero eight nine three three says Cabo, my sister. Uh, the question is. How effective is the UNIA and is there a program organized to help with repatriation? And Isaiah 3, okay, we said that before. All right, quite a few tweets trying to get uh, to them. At Wincy, thank you very much, my sister. All right, quite a few tweets, and we're having a, what do you call that situation now where everything stick? <laughs> That's what we're having in getting to the tweets. So everything stick. So let's see if we can get to the Facebook uh, messages. There are quite a few of those too. All right, so everything looked like it really stick, but I know who've been who've been responding. So Kwame Pianke, my brother, I see you. Uh, uh, Nana Akusua Asante, uh, Denise Isis Miller. All right, I see you. Uh, Roger Shaw, uh, saying Italia. <laughs> Shame on you, Roger. Italia. <laughs> also, Isaiah Cote d'Ivoire, Jack Gleason. I see you, Dale Davy. I know that you're all commenting on Facebook. I just am not able to open right now because, as I said, everything is sticking. And Papa Ken, good morning to you. Rasheen Wilson, Sunday, Sunayat Tesfami, and uh, Noel Morgan, my brother, uh, my sister Barbara Makeda Blake Hannah, uh, Dale Davy, Dama Zifa, Fitzroy Hay. And uh, quite a few more. If we're able to get to them, Rosemary Green, I see you're calling. Also, thank you for your texts. For those people who have the numbers and are texting. Uncle Jasaneb, Uncle Jasaneb, life, prosperity, health to you. One of the things we want to know, and I said that uh, for the for as long as it takes, I will be reading um, a speech from each prime, from a prime minister, anyone I can find, an um, Emancipation Day speech. I'm searching for them like crazy because we're still trying to find out whether or not the Ministry of Culture, along with any other ministry that is involved, are trying to shelve Emancipation Day celebrations. I want to find out what's happening at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. The question we're asking about with Jamaica National Heritage Trust is who's heading up the National Heritage Trust? Who are the people? Um, have you moved out all the black people from the National Heritage Trust um, top tier? And do you now only have Jews and Chinese and white people? And why? And if we're out of many one, where is the black representative, the African representative who's supposed to be representing the masses of the Jamaican people? Are you whitewashing the entire thing? Is the ministry whitewashing our culture? I am not afraid to ask these questions. And once again, we say courage is not the absence of fear. It is a recognition and the realization that there is something more important than fear. Now, instead, I'm, I'm going to start reading those uh, messages next week. What I want to do this week is to st go end where I started. So many of our ancestors fought for emancipation from enslavement. So many of them, not just the ones we know like Sam Sharp and, and Taki and, and just not, not just the names we know, but so many others, right? And they, some were killed, some were imprisoned, some were flogged mercilessly, but they fought knowing that they would be punished if caught, but they were fighting for something bigger than themselves. They were fighting for freedom, for full free, for liberation from slavery. And we honor those people and honor the promise of emancipation once every year. August 1, July 31 to August 1. It is something that we already fought for and won. We will not fight for it again. Let me say that to Minister Lisa Hanna. Let me say that to Dahlia Harris and the people at the Ministry of Culture. We fought and won. Let me say this to the people at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. We fought and won against governments who would not recognize Emancipation Day. We have already won that war. We will not fight it with you again. And we do that in the name of our ancestors. Here we go. 
We call their names. We call their names. We call their names. Ancestor come. We pay tribute and honor our ancestors, those who were tried and sentenced for their role in the 1831-1832 Emancipation War in Jamaica, the parish of Westmoreland. Garrick from Belfast in St. James, sentenced to 259 lashes. David Gibson from Clifton, sentenced to death. John Gilling, owned by Mrs. Parncher, sentenced to 36 lashes. Ishmael, alias Billy Grant from Prospect, 100 lashes. James Green, Clifton, sentenced to death. Frederick Gray from Rose Hill, sentenced to 100 lashes. Sam Hilton, from Lambs River, sentenced to 100 lashes. Philip Irving from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. William McIntosh from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 250 lashes. Duncan McKenzie from Flower Hill, sentenced to be transported. William McKinley, owned by S. Whittingham, sentenced to death. Richard McLeod from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. James Miller, owned by Dr. Fuller, sentenced to 160 lashes. John Morris from Clifton, acquitted. Coffey, alias Richard Morrison, from Rock Pleasant, sentenced to be transported. Richard Shelton from Duckett Spring and Lambs River, sentenced to 200 lashes. Premier, alias Richard Skelton, from Co Park, sentenced to be transported. John M. L. Stevens from Seven Inch, sentenced to 200 lashes. George Tharp, owned by enslaver George Tharp, sentenced to 150 lashes. Titus, alias George Waite from Richmond, sentenced to death. George Watson from Horton Grove, sentenced to be transported. Robert Whitehorn from Clantarf, sentenced to death. Edward Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Eliza Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Jane Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be hanged. S. Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. Robert Wigan from Lambs River, sentenced to be transported. Archie Wilson, owned by enslaver Archibald Wilson, sentenced to 150 lashes. John Wiley from Barnside, sentenced to be transported. Robert Morris, owned by Mary Spence, Stewie, sentenced to death. George Murray from Clifton, sentenced to death. Edward Partner, owned by Isabella Partner, sentenced to death. Philip, owned by William Shellett, sentenced to six months imprisonment. Southern trees. Cooper from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Henry Cowan from Argyle Pen, sentenced to death. Robert Davis from Sweet River, sentenced to be transported. Thomas Davis from Enfield, sentenced to be transported. Matty, alias Richard Drackett, owned by Mary Torrent, acquitted. John L. Lorry, owned by a white sailor, sentenced 14 days imprisonment. Hugh Ferguson from Clifton, sentenced to death. William Ferguson from Clifton, acquitted. Jack, alias John Fleming, owned by Daniel McGibbon, sentenced to 50 lashes. William Evans, alias Alexander Bentloss, from Welshpool Plantation, sentenced to death. William Brooks, Edward Bart, from Duckett Spring and the Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to death. John Bull, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. John Campbell, from Flaw Hill, sentenced to 120 lashes. William Chambers, owned by Mary Gray, sentenced to death. David Clark, owned by a Mr. Young, sentenced to 120 lashes. Samuel Jarrett from Crow Park, sentenced to death. Amelia Johnson, acquitted. 
Nelson Carr from Belfast, St. James, sentenced to 150 lashes. Edward Lambden from Barneyside, sentenced to death. Robert Lambert, owned by William Gillette, Esquire, sentenced to 39 lashes. John Linton from Heritage, sentenced to death. Joe Little from Walchpool, sentenced to be hanged but mercifully escaped. James Reed from Hermitage, sentenced to death. Thomas Reed from Lambs River, sentenced to 150 lashes. James Ricketts, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. Thomas Rook, McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. Samuel Sampson, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 14 days imprisonment. William Martin from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. A.C. McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. George McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. John McCallum from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 60 lashes. Robert McGee from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Alexander McGrother, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 200 lashes. James McIntosh, owned by Amelia McIntosh, sentenced to 250 lashes. Richard, alias Richard McIntosh, from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 100 lashes. Robert Allen, owned by enslaver Isabella Partner, sentenced to four dozen lashes. Jack Anderson, from the Retrieve Plantation, sentenced to death. John Appleton, from the Ducket Spring and Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to 100 lashes. David Atkinson, from Darleston, sentenced to death. William Atkinson, Darleston, sentenced to death. Fred, alias William Ball, owned by enslaver Mary Malin, sentenced to death. Daniel Barijam, from Fred, alias William Ball, owned by enslaver Mary Malin, sentenced to death. Daniel Barijam, from Chillons, sentenced to death. Billy, alias William Binham, from Golden Spring, sentenced to death. Blood on the leaves. We remember and honor those who walked and worked before us and thus paved the path down which we now walk. We made a promise to those who died in the Emancipation Wars. We made a promise to those who fought and died and were transported and were punished and were imprisoned in the Emancipation War. That we would see to the fulfillment of the promise of emancipation. That promise we have to keep. So we put on watch Minister Lisa Hanna and the Ministry of Culture. We say to Delia Harris, you are new to the position. Do not preside over the first scaling down since 1998 of the emancipation celebration in Jamaica. Go and read the files and find out how it is done. We are putting on watch the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. You can whitewash the Jamaica National Heritage Trust all you want. We say that we've got you in our sights because we've got a promise to keep. That's a promise of emancipation. This is how we say goodbye for today from the Africa Forum. Running African, my name is Kabu. Kabu Ma'at Kiru, my broadcast assistant, was Joy Morgan. Thanks to all those who participated in the program this morning. Thank you very much for coming in, for being a part of the program, for tweeting, for Facebooking, and for just being there. The Big A, where the Sunday sunshine is up next. See you next week. Thanks to Roger Haspel for sitting in last week and to Kay and Cole. Thank you very much. See you next week.